morning. Good morning. It can't sound like we're not excited this morning. Good morning. A very, very warm welcome to you. This morning, we are at Ubunifu and we are ready. Are we ready? I am ready. Are you ready? Okay, at least physical participants are ready. I hope virtual participants are ready and that you can hear me very well and clearly. If you can hear me, please um, go to your reactions and give me a thumbs up. I'm looking at the screen. Go to your reactions and give me a thumbs up. Uh, and, and that would be good. If you can hear us and you're a virtual participant, please give us a thumbs up. And technical team, you can confirm this for me. As they do that, I am very excited to be here this morning. Uh, this has been. And you are a virtual participant to see about the standard. And the second thing you can confirm what you do. To do that, I am very excited to be here with you. This has been. This has been. This has been. This has been. I just want to welcome all of you guys to this wonderful space. I'll just give an introduction of who we are and what we do over here. So Planet One is an initiative that is in collaboration between Greenpeace and a free shoe set. Greenpeace is an environmental campaigning organization and free shoe set is a youth uh, empowering organization. So these two organizations came together on climate or environment and youths. So uh, we provide a safe space for the youths to come and learn, to come and share their ideas. And our end goal to make is to make sure that uh, we help our youths with the right skills, with the right knowledge, and helping them to have confidence to even change the status quo in our world right now. So um, we are guided by four pillars. That is the climate justice, advocacy, innovation, youth empowerment, and engagement. And uh, yeah, we have a learning series where it goes for six weeks where we teach our young people on these pillars. We go a mile ahead to also ask them to identify an environmental problem that is happening in their community. Then from there, we find that, uh, like, um, they, uh, we ask them to write a proposal to it. 
which we've trained them how to do it, then we fund that project. And that's how we create change in our little big way. So Karibuni Sana to Bunifu Hub, and feel free to use any part of this place. Maybe I think uh, the MC will do the house rules, but I can do it. Okay. So uh, for the ladies, your washroom is over here. Just come over here. Please. Uh, it's written washroom visuri over here. Uh, for our gents, we love you, but hey, uh, we have a grilled door outside there. So that's where our urinals and our washrooms are. Just behind this banner, this uh, drop uh, banner, we have uh, water. So please, you can just go pick water over there and there are glasses on that sink over there. So um, Ubunifu is a plastic free zone. I really hope you don't have any single use plastics. Yeah, and uh, looking forward to have a wonderful day ahead. You're going to have breaks and all those things. So uh, please make sure you settle well and feel at Ubunifu. Karibu sana. Thank you very much, Jarans. Please give him another round of applause for that warm welcome. So my name is Sam. Nyamwange. And I am an environmentalist, I'm a storyteller, I'm very, very many things. But I would like to know some of you and what you expect from today. I told you my expectations earlier. I have told you my name. Isn't it only fair that some of you tell me, you know, your names, who you are, but also what you expect from today? And I will pick at random. So, good morning. How are you? Fine. What is your name and what are your expectations today? Uh, I am Nora Hatieno, and I'm expecting to learn from you people and also to share my knowledge with you. Brilliant. Nora is expecting to learn. Nora is expecting to share her knowledge as well. Good morning. Good morning. I'm fine. What are you? I'm Melina Bisa. And my expectations are to know the role of the youth at COP. Brilliant. To know the role of youth at COP. Good morning, sir. My name is Sydney, Sydney Opio. And um, I look forward to um, having discussions on climate change and climate justice with the rest of all right, he's looking forward to having discussions with attendees. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm Calvin Bidanya. Uh, one of my expectations is to interact with fellow youth, learn what we can forge ahead. All right. Thank you very much to all those volunteers who I chose at random. But technical team, if we can go to our Mentimeter boards, and I would like that, I would like to ask each and every one of us to go to menti.com. Online audience too. And have the Mentimeter boards. And present that. All right. Now we've had that the name of our workshop today is what? What is the name of our workshop today? It's a post-COP27 youth sharing event between Youth for Nature, Africa Youth Caravan, and Ubunifu Hub. So when you hear all these words, what is the one thing that comes to mind about today's workshop? Go to menti.com and use the code 2750-6858. The first person to get on Menti and the first person whose response I see on the screen will get a gift from me. Menti.com, the code is 2750 6854. Are we there? If you're, if, you, if you're there, you can give me a signal by clapping or snapping, or you're there. 
Are you the first person? Please let your engagement, or the one thing, not be high. <laughs> All right, we have change, youth, engagement, conversation. What is the one thing that comes to mind? Looking forward for more. If you're not there yet, it's menti.com. The code is 2750-6854. Maker spaces, climate justice, COP27, sharing, change, learning, post COP27. All these are beautiful, beautiful things. We are all in the right space, clearly. We're in the right mind frame. Climate justice. I'll give you one more minute. Before we move to the next thing. Is that all our one things? Brilliant. I saw something move, change, climate. COP27 seems to be taking the space, taking the lead. All right. Now, earlier, I had talked about the expectations, what we have geared up. When we're creating the program, when we're creating everything, there are some things that we have geared up towards. But then... What are your expectations? If we can move to the next slide, please. Still on the same link, uh, the next slide should ask you a question. If you click next, it should. So what are your expectations from this workshop? It should pop up on the same link that you're using. What are your expectations? Ours were to share perspectives about COP and how youth navigated the space. Also to share the outcomes of COP and how it aligns to the local and regional context. And finally, to debunk myths and misconception about COP and how the youth can, can use the space to build synergies that provide a platform to network and collaborate both towards and beyond the upcoming COP. It doesn't have to be that long. Ours was long because we needed to find the outcome after the session. But then what are your expectations from today? Uh, someone put in the answer a bit too quickly. Yes. The code is 2750-6854. 2750-6854. All right. So sharing knowledge on COP. Someone is looking to share stories. I, I have very brilliant stories about COP and I'll be sharing some of them. Uh, learning how youth can be engaged, further engagement, collaboration, learning, engage to network. On ground impact, I love that. Youth empowerment, love it. Um, yeah, it keeps changing. <laughs> Engaging, I love that as well. Brilliant. Thank you for all these expectations. And since Mr. Hen was our first person for the first question, he shall get a gift from me. Remember, if you can pan away from me <laughs> as I find my gift so that these guys don't see where my gift is. This is all the way from Egypt, imported from Sharm El Sheikh. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, please give him a clap. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Now we have a very packed agenda with you today. And I hope that you have as fun uh, an engagement with me as I hope to have with you. Now for the next uh, one hour, one hour and a half, we will get introduced to uh, Youthful Nature, Keen, what the workshop will be doing. We'll get a keynote speech and then we'll have a panel discussion on synthesizing key outcomes from COP27. And then we'll have a coffee break at the top of hour two. From hour two to hour four, we'll have... Uh, two sessions on nature-based solutions and another one on assessing climate consciousness of policy statements on multilateral environmental conferences from the whole of 2022. So we'll be talking a bit more, just not about COP27, just a little bit more, yeah? And then we'll have uh, lunch, after which we'll have youth engagement at COP. Now, last year's COP, we had very, very interesting stuff. We had the first children and youth pavilion. Say woo if you saw it. 
All right, guys who are at COP did not see it clearly. <laughs> it's unfortunate. You guys went all the way to Sham El Sheikh to not see the children and youth pavilion. Unfortunate. But anyway, we'll get to hear, you know, the people who actually engaged in it and, and how it was, what challenges, what were the wins, what does that look like going forward? And finally, we'll do a plenary on the road to COP28. What are the things that we need to put in place? What needs to happen to ensure that the youth voice is actually put in place within COP28? Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite the first, actually not the first, the second speaker, but uh, a very important fellow altogether. A fellow who most of you know very, very well. Uh, where is my good friend, Jaffa Oriani? Please take a seat at the stage. Now, Mr. Oriani is an environmentalist and a community development enthusiast from Kenya, of course. <laughs> you can see from his dressing. And whose passion and interests and experiences are driven by sustainability practices. He is a global ambassador for the Youth for Nature and a project intern for the pl flagship project in Nuka, which is a nature-based solutions accelerator program. Uh, that is aimed at showcasing nature-based solutions in practice while building the capacity of youth to take on environmental stewardship. He is a millennial fellowship of uh, class of 2020 volunteer and VDA activist with Greenpeace Africa. Good morning, Mr. Jaffa. Oh, very good morning to you and good morning to everyone. How are you today? Feeling good. This has been a long journey. Uh, when when would you say this journey started for you? I think uh, the post COP twenty seven event is um, is just part of the journey mm -hmm. because this I think every part of my life has been leading me to this point to this moment mm -hmm. and uh, the Africa Youth Caravan to COP twenty seven Youth mm -hmm. for Nature events whatever and everything that every one of you guys did last year mm -hmm. brought us here so it has been a long journey. Brilliant. I can't I can't pinpoint an exact an exact <laughs> all right. I, I love that because I have walked with you in this journey and I love to see you here now. So please could you introduce us to Youth for Nature, introduce us to Keen, introduce us to the caravan, introduce us to COP, but also introduce us to what your expectations are and what you aim to do at the end of this workshop. I thank you very much, Sam Nyamange. I I will take you. I'll give you a brief intro on what Youth for Nature is, what KIN is, what Africa Youth Caravan is, and what we aim or what we uh, hope to achieve with this event. And so, and first of all, welcome to the Y4N Africa Caravan Cross Sharing Workshop. Uh, this is a safe space for you and me uh, to interrogate the status quo and exchange ideas, how we can improve if not set precedents towards a future we all envision, for there can not be anything for us without us. As we always say, they cannot talk about this thing without us because we are the future and we are the present, right? So Youth for Nature and Africa Youth Caravan to COP27, and uh, uh, before I go to that, I'll introduce Youth for Nature. Youth for Nature is a international, a global uh, NG, non-profit NGO, a by youth for youth organization, based in Canada, but has regional offices all across the world. Uh, we have offices, uh, we have a West Africa, West Asia region. We have uh, Asia and the Pacific. We have Africa region, Latin America and the Caribbean, North America, Eastern uh, Europe and Central Europe. And then uh, as a youth organization, we mostly work on three pillars. Our work centers through three pillars. One is on Capacity building where we believe that youth have the potential if only they can be given the necessary resources, the necessary support and skills to in order to upscale their work and to engage in the space more meaningfully. We also work uh, on net knowledge sharing where we share knowledge like this event is a knowledge sharing event. We want to unpack what happened at COP, not everything, but what we think we should because we know we cannot unpack everything. Then the last one is on um, storytelling. And at Youth for Nature, we use storytelling not as the end itself, but as a vehicle of change. Uh, because we believe that if each one of us has a unique story, and whatever your story is, 
uh, whatever background you have if you share that story we hope the hope is that it will it will inspire other people out there to take action or to share their own stories and uh, our story training unit has over 300 stories from across the globe you can access them on our storytelling map storytellers map uh, on our website at youthfornature.org so kin is a national youth facing organization i am a, i'm the comms co director there and my executive director is there kaluki paul we are uh, what we what we try to do with kin is also more similar as youth for nature but you're a bit different because we are very locally focused and regionally focused in africa we are looking at how do we empower youths to occupy these spaces to represent themselves and their communities in these spaces while also capacity building them looking at restoration we have projects like bustani gardens where we are installing projects in primary schools and secondary schools so that these kids can have an experiential learning on how they can implement nature-based solutions and adapt or do organic farming in their communities while tackling and adapting to climate change the africa youth caravan is a in project which was which aimed to take 20 youths to cop 27 uh, so that they can share their stories there which we did so very quickly because i know we have a program that is fully packed and i will, i don't want to take much time so youth for nature and africa youth caravan to cop 27 enabled young people from around the world to participate in the 27th conference of parties in shamal sheikh we all know uh, I, I i don't want to assume that you all know the what con conference of parties is so conference of parties is a is a conference uh, that takes place annually where world leaders stakeholders ngos come together to talk about the most challenging issue of our time because as barack obama said this is the most challenging issue of our time this generation so we're trying to see how do we develop these policies that are going to guide us in implementing the projects that we need in ensuring that there is well-being in implementing the sustainable development goals and you know if the, the giant doesn't end at the conference of parties the conference of parties is just the cul culmination of all these conferences that take uh take uh, that people take part in across the year like uh, the united nation environmental assembly UNEA, uh uh, the uh, Africa Protected Areas Congress, World Forestry Congress, uh, COP15, everything that happens in these events, you'll, you'll find that the other conference always adapts whatever was agreed on there. So your participation in these events ensures that your opinion, your ideas are incorporated in here, even if you're just participating in the local conference of youths, they all culminate to the big things, and those things trickle down back to you. So they start with you and end back to you, but it, they can only be meaningful if you participate actively. So the, the last one happened in Sharm el-Sheikh in, in Egypt. Uh, so as I was saying, it's a critical forum of making decisions about the climate and nature that have far reaching impact on current and future generations. Despite the importance of this forum, young people and marginalized communities have historically been excluded from these discussions. If you talk to most of youths who are at COP like Barbara, Kaloki, Bulimo, Sam, they will share with you the stress that just organizing or even going there is getting badges uh going to visas then sponsor yourself to there or uh, get a scholarship or a funding to attend that place now go there try to figure out everything where do you eat where do you go? it's stressful um however as young people make up a large portion of the global population we are taking the lead in implementing real world solutions and they must have, and as young people we must have access to these forums to share our experiences ideas perspectives on the policies being developed as i said earlier there can be nothing without us nothing about us without us we have to be in these spaces the africa youth caravan conference 7 aim to highlight the role of young people in africa as knowledgeable solution oriented individuals and to give 20 africa youth individuals from various regions to the opportunity to go to cop as a capacity building event because when they go there they network and uh, they share this knowledge or their stories there they mobilize for resources and partnership and this is what we are hoping for sustainable collaboration 
and uh, bring back the solution and resources to their communities. We hope those 20 youths are doing something in their communities or are starting on something so that they don't just have the goal to go to COP and relax. They are always doing something. So Youth for Nature, on the other hand, aim to increase justice and interconnection in climate policies and improve policy knowledge and skills at COP. Key achievements included co-creating the Children and Youth Pavilion that Nyamwange talked about, launching the AGL project, which is a West of West Asia project, hosting storytelling for change at COI 17, which is a conference of youth, uh, engaging in five speaking engagements, collecting 30 micro stories led by Odiambo, who is here, and co-authoring a letter to the Brazilian president calling for a youth climate council. As you can see, this youth organization achieved a lot given the limited resources they had. Linking youth action in the climate nature space to solidarity means recognizing the benefits of cross-sharing knowledge, experiences, and skills to achieve common goals. By pooling our resources and sharing best practices, young people can create synergies that are more powerful than individual efforts alone. That is what this event aims to achieve, linking these two, uh, event, two delegations and trying to see the outcomes of these delegations, what they learned there, can this be shared to you? And if yes, how? So we are hoping that by the, uh, my expectation is by the end of the event, you will tell us how you want these this resources that we gathered there to share, to be shared to you. Because we have a pile of resources, but how do we get to you? We have a pile of networks, a pile of collaborators. How do we get to you? Because as you already highlighted, you are doing amazing work on the ground. How do this amazing work get highlighted on our storytelling platform? How do you get the opportunity to meet funders, to meet partners? and to ensure that your project is upscaled. So we believe that youth engagement is key to achieving climate action, and we are thrilled to have you all here to contribute to this important conversation. We hope this event will inspire you to take action and continue engaging with climate issues as individual and as a collective force. Finally, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to a thought-provoking and productive discussion. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I know I can be very boring. <laughs> well, I can I can tell you are not boring, but please remain on the set. Uh, you you talked about the experiences that happen at COP and very interesting experiences. You know the visa journey, all that. Could you give us one interesting experience that happened for you as a young person at his first COP ever? I mean, interesting. You mean negative or positive? Uh, I mean, <laughs> you decide. <laughs> yeah. So, as you can see, I've been arranged, as we say here in Kenya. So uh, the, I think the most interesting thing about going to COP for me, yes, there were many challenges, but the interesting thing was I was not aware how big COP actually was. There were over 40,000 people there. And I realized that in, uh, I, I'm always saying I want to network, I want to meet people. I was tired of meeting people <laughs> because there were these sessions and this, okay. When you go to COP, there are two events happening, right? Or two uh, zones. There is the blue zone and the green zone. The blue zone is where the main thing is happening, where diplomats are going, many diplomats are going, where most NGOs have their pavilion, most countries have their pavilions. And in these pavilions, they host sessions. Uh, there can be three sessions or two sessions per day or just one session. But for country pavilions, you, you find that most delegations from the countries go there to, to organize an event they are hosting somewhere or also just to host another event. And even other organizations are free to apply for these sessions prior so that if, uh, the, the, uh, the UNFCC COP can, the UNFCC can organize who is going where and who is going to attend which session. So you see, that's the green zone. They are over a hundred pavilions, I think. Then there is the green zone, which also have as many pavilions, even more. And there we have exhibitions from organizations across the globe who are doing amazing work in renewable resources, uh, renewable energy resources, uh, nature-based solutions, storytelling, uh, community development, fund finance sector, banking, even oil industries, they, oil companies. They are there, and everybody is trying to bring you to their pavilion and you don't know where to go. So one thing I realized is that you have to really have, uh, organize yourself. I was lucky to have a, a team 
that I, I was working with. Uh, we were led by Kaluki, and we had our comms lead was Aita Joshua Pamaku. He will be speaking here later. Uh, who we together we had this program of events that we should prioritize. So this enabled me to know I, which event I need to go to. But even with this, I still got lost for the first two days. I was trying to find which where is which pavilion, and you realize in the second week is when I realized there is actually another zone, which is the innovation zone. And I also had to go there to see what's happening. And there you go, you find these organizations, big ones, you only hear them, you only see them on television, I'm here, KPMG, uh, PWC, Deloitte, uh, they were there. And everybody here is sharing what they are doing. And you know, sometimes what's online, people cannot see, but when you go there, you see these things and you realize I'm not utilizing the internet as I should. I should do more. And I think the most, uh, the best experience I got there is about the people. The people there were friendly to me. I think I don't know if because I was, uh, I was very friendly too because I know I have a friendly face. But I can say that there was the people were very hospitable uh, to us from Alexandria to Cairo to Sham al Sheikh. I did not experience any kind of discrimination. Things were good. The taxi, the taxi drivers were amazing. Uh, they always say yalla, and I will, I will, I, that's the only Arabic uh, uh, word I know, and Habibi. So it was an amazing experience. So <laughs> thank you, Sam, for the question. All right. Thank you very much. You can yalla your way out of there. Thank you very much. Thank Please you. give him a round of applause. Asante sana, uh, Orieni. And online participants, please let us know what you think. Let us know what your feelings are. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat. And if anything comes through, we shall be speaking about it. Now, people, it is time for our keynote address. And what I like most about hosting such sessions, especially for young people, is when the keynote is actually given by a young person. This young person has a few years to leave the youth bracket, but he is solidly placing himself uh, within the youth space, but also ensuring that he is mentoring young people, ensuring that, you know, he leaves a solid legacy for other young people to follow, to ensure that also the youth voice is had in the right spaces. Please help me give another, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to, how to do this now. I'm going to change it from clubs because you guys are mean with clubs. So there's something that we call digital where I work. So it's digital claps and you do this. So you must raise your hand and you must snap, okay? So please raise your hand as if you are saying, hi, teacher. No, it, it's a, it was a sif, not you. <laughs> not you actually saying. All right, now start snapping as I call out his name. Mr. Kaluki, Paul Mutuku. Keep on snapping, keep on snapping as he comes up to the stage. Please make your way. Thank you very much. Now, Paul, before you give your keynote. Good morning. Morning, Sam. Morning, everyone. How are you feeling today? I think I'm alive. That's number one. Um, I'm feeling youthful. That's number two. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, um, I was at COP. And you could say I was the 21st delegate of the Africa Youth Caravan. And at COP, whenever anyone said Africa Youth Caravan, it was almost synonymous to his name because he's worked very hard to ensure that this, you know, comes to fruition. I might be stealing your keynote speech, but could you tell us what was the experience like, you know, for you way before could you just give us an overview of how did this idea come to your mind? Uh, having attended a couple of COPs before, why did you think that youth were important to take to COP and so on? And what was the experience having a big number of youth with you at COP? Thanks, Sam, for that. And again, a very good uh, morning to all of you. Hope you a good, good morning. And good morning to our online audience. Uh, my full name is Kaluki Paul. I prefer Kaluki. And I tell them that in English it means honey, but you can only call me honey after five. Uh, between eight and five, it's Kaluki, yeah? 
Um, so I think for me, it was very important to sort of organize and bring young African leaders to COP because number one, I think we understand that, um, especially from the West, most people are talking about, you know, um, Africa being the world's youngest population and, you know, the sub-Saharan population being expected to um, grow in numbers by the turn of the century. And so the question we ask ourselves is you're giving us a problem. So what is the solution, right? And, and most of the times you don't find these folks talking about the need to send African voices, the need to meaningfully engage young voices, farmers and grassroots organizations. So through the African Youth Caravan that I helped to lead, um, we, we really wanted to bring these African voices to COP, but not just bring them to COP. Number one, we wanted to engage them through meaningful dialogues across the regions. And I can attest to you that we were in all the regions in Africa. We organized successful workshops that led to a strong African Youth Statement on COP27. Um, and I think for me, this becomes very important because if we want to speak to the world leaders, then at times we need these policy recommendations, we need these, we need these statements to be able to speak their language. So we were able to, of course, uh, deliver this statement and uh, organize several events with the co-presidency, with the uh, youth um, constituency and other key stakeholders who had also pitched camp at COP27. So some to, to me, I think this was all important because it brought the perspective of African youth. It capitalized on, you know, the solutions and initiatives that African youth are doing, but it also gave them the power to co-lead by being at the same space where their presidents, CEOs, and big people that most times are not um, accessible. Um, so this time it was possible for these youth to meet with them, connect with them, and also, of course, then network with fellow youth from across the world that are doing one, two, three in the climate and environmental space. And for that reason, I believe it was successful, and we really achieved our mandate as, as a youth um, constituents. Brilliant. Now, just before you give your keynote, because I must, and I'm using this word loosely because we will go into it and describe it further in the next session. Let me tokenize you. <laughs> uh, now, Kaluki is a Kenyan climate activist and environmentalist and is working to improve youth participation in decision-making around climate justice. He is the co-founder of Kenya Environmental Activists Network, and he is also the Africa Regional Director at Youth for Nature. His center of attraction for Africa lies around environmental rejuvenation, afforestation, organic farming, and youth leadership across the world. Kaluki, welcome. Thank you, Sam. Um, I promised the keynote would be very short, I think sweet, Maybe not sassy, but it will be engaging. Um, and of course, around reflections from COP27 and you know what we expected, what were the outcomes. Uh, I'd first start with my own project, the Africa Youth Caravan to COP27, to which some of my colleagues are here. And of course, we organized this with the need and, and realization that young people in Africa are doing a lot of work, right? And that we need to center that youth action and that we need to literally give them the actual space uh, to be in these decision-making spaces and, and make their voices count. We also needed to showcase strongly that resilience is a thing that is not new to Africans or developing world countries, and that there are many communities, youth included, farmers, that are doing a lot of resilience work to sort of you know, create cushioning systems that would actually safeguard them in the face of the climate crisis and biodiversity loss, but also needed to showcase that, you know, just energy transition is not an idea that Africans must be forced into, it, or that must be imposed into Africans, that we need to send African voices, we need to ensure that um, Africans themselves understand the energy needs domestically and regionally, and therefore create their own um, solutions. Um, and so these were the key messaging that we uh, kept uh, around the caravan journey. And we were able to secure funding, of course. My colleague Gorenia has talked about the 20 African youth that we were able to take to COP. But that's not the point um, yeah, today. The, the main point was so, what were the expectations? 
talking about young people uh, being the leaders of tomorrow, we say we are, yes, leaders of tomorrow, but we're also leaders of today because most of you have initiatives, most of you are running hubs, most of you are doing a lot of amazing works, but at times that action is not considered action, right? People want us to, you know, do something big and grand, and then that's why you can be recognized. Some activists you've seen, most people know them because of, um, and I'd be very apologetic about this, you know, raising placards and just going on the streets without any meaningful action. And so these become celebrities. And my question is always, to what extent are you doing this kind of activism, right? Uh, but then there are many of us who are doing small things in our different ways, and this needs to be celebrated. What happens to that person who, who is voiceless or rather thinks they don't have a voice? So our main approach was let's try to you know, create this space where everyone feels equal and represented, and they can't voice out their, you know, their, their concerns in the climate um, space. Um, a few terms that I think are very important around the COP27, most of you have heard about the Santiago Network, there was also implementation mechanism on loss and damage. Uh, we've heard of recently the Sham el Sheikh implementation plan, SHIP, in short. And so this whole thing to go to what Africans through the Africa group of negotiators were expecting. And number one, it was about time that we need to set up the loss and uh, damage facility. And of course, I think we understand loss and damage that it's, it's all you know around the consequences to climate change to which communities and people cannot um, cope with right and so and this is happening across many global south and developing countries that most of the times people have agriculture as their backbone but um you know in the, in the face of climate change the climate crisis and biodiversity loss most of these communities cannot continue with the same cultural and natural practices they've been having on their farms, around their ecosystems. And so how do you then help them cope with this effect of the impacts of the climate crisis while still um, mitigating the impacts at the same time? So loss and damage becomes a very key um, contribution towards helping communities addre address and cope with the impacts of climate change. Um, and so it was one of the things that most people were following, including us as a youth delegation to COP that we wanted this to be set up. And of course, I think there was an outcome of um, it being established. Um, and, and my own personal perspective is, I think what we did was more curative than it was preventive. At times, you can bear me witness some, um, <laughs> we set up a facility, which was like a big bucket without water. And so the question is, where do we get the water? Um, so, and, and then again, the question of, who gets to decide who gets what part of the funding, right? Climate change does not discriminate, but the people who are making the decision about climate change are discriminating in the sense that they get to decide if, uh, for instance, my friend Victor from Kenya is more vulnerable, um, he gets more money than someone in Madagascar who is exposed to more you know, island effects and the climate crisis is impacting them more. So because they're a small country, perhaps people say they'll receive less money from the loss and damage. So I do feel that's one of the gray areas that needs to go into the loss and damage. And that's why we're here today to discuss more and have an understanding on where we need this discussion to go and what is the place of young African leaders to guide the discussion. Um, second last point is, of course, I was happy that we had um, the Children and Youth Pavilion, uh, which is one of the areas that most people connected. Um, I'll assure you it had people like you. And, and I feel for me it's important because it, it allows us to have equal power with other constituents at the climate space. We understand that several constituents like, you know, the farmers, the working group, we have a private sector and many other uh, working groups or constituencies so having these youth and children pavilions are very important to ensure that we set our voices, bring our solutions and invite partners to fund us, support our actions. Um, and the last point I'll end is by saying that nature-based solutions those are very big ex expectations that we know from recent uh, statistics and data, nature contributes to about a third of the solution to the climate crisis. But at times when you see um, how nature is being funded actually does not earn more than I think 3% of global funding for climate um, issues. So then nature-based solutions was one of the strong areas that most negotiators had gone to Egypt to push for. 
And of course, it was discussed, though we know that it did not finally appear on the final text, and there are many questions, but true to the cause at COP15, CBD COP15, of course, uh, NBS was highly mentioned. So I do think this is a big win, and we need more actions. We need to dis discuss more, and these forums are exactly needed to ensure we have these meaningful engagements, but not just discussions. I don't believe in discussions that don't lead into action. We need to discuss what challenges we're facing in our initiatives, what solutions we are fronting, and how we can create this community of expertise, this network that can now allow us to scale up and reach more people, have more impact, and actually communicate to world leaders who are the very people entrusted with power and, and making the decisions about the future of the planet that, by the way, we are the ones who are going to inherit and live with the consequences of the current leaders. So I do hope it will be a meaningful engagement today. I wish that we make it fun, grand, and I believe I'm stealing the show by saying by the power, sorry, wasted on me. <laughs> I declare this uh, workshop um, like officially uh, open and let's have meaningful uh, conversations. Back to you, Sam. Now, Kaluki, you have to say it like you believe it. You didn't say it like you believe it. Could you repeat that last statement? Because you know, th this this is no longer, this is not open unless you actually open it. So repeat it and say it like you mean it. Well, guys, um, by the powers vested on me, I declare this workshop officially open. And thanks to Youth for Nature, Keen, Ubunifu, and other partners that have made this possible. Brilliant. Before you leave, chill, chill. Question. And then if anyone of you has a question, you, you may ask too. But I'm very interested to find out what was the most painful experience for you in the process of taking 20 African youth to COP and at COP, the whole process. What was the most painful experience? Okay. Um, thanks, Sam, for that. You know, to be honest with you, I think I cannot pinpoint one thing. There were several of these, but I'll be fair to you, I'll try to give three. If you allow me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think the first challenge and painful experience was at times, like I've said, young people are doing a lot of work, but usually it, it seems the funder community, we do not have that bargaining power, or no one wants to trust that with the, their finances to enable us to show what we're doing. So it was very hard to fundraise and, and imagine taking 20 youth to a cop. It's not a walk in the park. You have to think of, you know, the workshop that went into it, the people had to pay, be paid, services had to be booked, people had to be, get their tickets booked from all different countries. You don't understand the different jurisdictions. Accommodation, which was very crazy, had to be booked. So, so I feel like that bit of financing was really uh, a pain point for me. But we are glad that we finally got someone who trusted us enough to secure funding. And that's why the caravan is what most of you know. Um, I think accommodation was one of our hardest beats. Guys being in Sharm El Sheikh, which by the way is a very artificial city, was very expensive. And I think we spent about the um, 2.5 million Kenya shillings worth on accommodation. And, and to me, my thinking was, honestly, do you have to just put your money into accommodation when the youth that you're bringing don't even have funding to continue the works they're doing on the ground? But then on the other side, it was necessary for us to do that. And, and the, the, the bit of it that there was a lot of extension on the side of the Egyptian counterparts and um, the COP fee just went up by more than triple and it was just expensive to accommodate people. Um, what my good friends Oriani Bulimo and Joshua here will tell you is what we booked is not what we got. Um, it was more like ruins that were our accommodation some came to see and honestly that was humbling and also like a moment of reflection that it's you don't you don't always get what you see online you know so we know our money went away but somehow we had to accommodate people we had to sort of cool people's emotions and still show them at the end of the day you're in shamel shake and this is your moment so go and conquer I think those are the two main ones that I think were pain points for me. Um, maybe the final one that most delegates were falling sick. And I was afraid that how will we deliver? How do we ensure that we still manage to really put our messaging out there and, and get everyone back to their countries in you know good health, in one piece, while still they're alive? So 
there were all these things that were happening in the hindsight, but then gladly, because I'm a stubborn optimist, I know I forced most of my delegates to go to hospital, um, get checked up, and it was also expensive to pay the fees. And, and then, of course, in the end, it all turned out well. So those three, some, I think, are the painful experiences. Brilliant. I think you deserve a hug. <laughs> and I shall not hug you, but I shall invite Barbara. Please walk up to the stage and please give Kaluki a hug. And as you do that, you please sit on that seat. You, you can tokenize them with a digital clap as they... <laughs> Or, no, 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 please sit. Yes. <laughs> now on stage with me, I have two uh, people who went to COP. People who gave their life, people who gave their all to fight for youth spaces at COP. So I want to have a short discussion with them and to really synthesize the key outcomes that came out of COP27 and what came about. And we have an online participant as well. But Barbara, who I've invited on stage to give Kaluki a hug. Kaluki, please keep on with the good work. Uh, we, we still want to go to Dubai. So <laughs> more, more, more youth need to go to Dubai. And, uh, but Barbara, who I've invited on the stage, is an environmental and climate activist from Kenya. She is a community trainer and com uh, climate educator on climate justice at Planet One right here. You may clap for her just, just because she is at the same space that she trains. Uh, she is a youth capacity building fellow at Climate Vulnerable Forum. She's also the founder of Last Shade Initiative. I wonder what shade they give there, but it is a youth led organization which focuses on creating awareness on environmental conservation and climate change and increasing resilience in the local communities through behavior modification. Karibu Sana Barbara. Barbara, how are you? I am fine, I guess. <laughs> How are you feeling this morning? How are you feeling being on the hot seat? To be honest, I feel nostalgic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How so? What does this remind you of? <laughs> um, I think it just takes me back to a time when I was overwhelmed with so much, um, so much things to do, and eventually it becomes also emotional, like how everything else just, it's like you're used to being on the ground and yeah. doing all these things on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then you also get to the place where you're seeing where all these decisions that are being made and how they trickle down to you and how you receive, you get them on the receiving end and just feeling the gap that's in between. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Now, you know, could you tell us one COP27 experience, what was, you know, what was that overall wholesome experience for you? I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> I was right. tired. Mm -hmm. I think, um, well, I didn't even get a chance to say hi to everyone else. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you're good. So, um, well, as much as we're all trying to keep this positive, I think we have to also be realistic about it. Mm. Um I was very tired, to be honest, because I remember the whole rush before getting there mm -hmm. and then getting there. And I was more on following up on the negotiation side mm -hmm. because the kind of funding that I got like was involved the uh, capacity building based on negotiations. So it was while everyone else was getting lost on the pavilions, I was also getting lost on the other sides and trying to find what to follow up on, what, um, what to listen to, because there are also negotiations on everything. Mm -hmm. Everyone is lobbying for everything. There are negotiations on Paris Agreement, um, 1.5 degrees, there are negotiations on carbon credits, negotiations on loss and damage. So it, it, was, uh, it was a lot to take in. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Barbara. And I am told we have our first online analyst, uh, do we have Menutula with us? Menatula, sorry. Men yes. Menatula Salah with us. Can you hear us, Men Menatula? Mena? Yes, yes. Good morning. Oh, brilliant. Uh, hi, Mena. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Very well, thank you. Where are you joining us from this morning? Egypt. <laughs> Which part of Egypt? Um, uh, Aseti. Uh, called Banha, close uh -huh. to Cairo. 
the capital. Brilliant. The only thing I got that was close to Cairo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's really, really nice to have you. Now, mm -hmm. I am told that you have over eight years of experience in climate change field, focusing on research, public awareness, and capacity building. And you're the CEO of Climutopia, which supports pathways of adaptation and resilience to climate change impact in local communities. And you are the head of plenaries working group of COI-17. How was that experience like for you? Uh, okay, it was my first time to, uh, to attend COP2, but uh, I want to say that I'm sharing the same opinion with Barbara, that it was a tired experience, stressed also, but mm -hmm. it was very rich for me. Uh, I think I gained a lot me as Mena and also also my organization Climatopia. Mm -hmm. Now what um, and then just going right straight into my question having you know worked very closely with uh, COI-17 how was that experience planning for it and what do you think was the outcome of COI-17 and and what was the lead up to COP27 with that? I can't hear you, Sam, please, uh, again. Please. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's clear. All right. So I was asking, what was the experience of planning and uh, actually going through COI-17? And what was the outcome of, you, you know, what outcomes of COI-17 impacted uh, or, or what was the lead up to COP27 with that? Okay. Um, about me, uh, how... Uh, how I joined uh, COI-17, it was like that I'm part of Yungu. Uh, it is uh, the youth uh, organization under UNFCCC. Uh, I was uh, a member there for many years. Also, I was um, a member of the local conference of youth in Egypt. So um, I participated with an uh, organization called ACTS. Uh, it was uh, responsible for um, COI-17. We started working on that about in, in June on July. For me, it was a great experience to deal with uh, over uh, 100 facilitators and trainers. Um, and about the outcomes, uh, I think it was a good space to share experience and know that youth around the world, they have a great things to share and a great experience in their countries. Uh, also, COI had a work statement for youth, which um, was delivered to uh, COP27 presidency. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will come back to you just shortly. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to come back to Barbara and Kaluki. Uh, Kaluki, I know this was not your first COP. Was this your first COP? All right. So having been your first COP, I know you must have had politics pre-COP. That COP is a very, and, and this is now where I use tokenization as uh, a more serious term and uh, not loosely as before. You know, COP is a space where youth are tokenized. It's a very extractive space. It's exclusive and has really failed so far to engage young people the way it should. What were your key findings you know, having attended COP this time, what are your key findings and what would you recommend based on what you found COP to be? Okay. Um, I think maybe I'll just try and break it down a little bit. So um, when it comes to inclusion, so um, as much as we want to include these young people, how inclusive are the processes Say, for example, um, just getting the budgets. Uh, funding is one thing and getting a budget is another mm -hmm. thing. And then you realize that there are also different types of budgets and different um, and different funders would, would also um, yeah, they are funding towards different types of budgets. So, um, and then that is one thing. Another thing is, um, do people really understand these things? Because I also came to understand that while in the process that um, there are budgets for the press, there are budgets for their party budgets, there are observer budgets and what it actually means. So um, I think that was one finding. There's such a big gap. And as much as they want to involve these young people, they also lack the knowledge of the whole process. Um, getting there is one thing and the process of getting there is also another thing that people also need to understand. 
And then um, in terms of um, tokenism, um, are we just there for show or are they really listening to us? Um, I think um, the youth right now have uh, have come to the um, realization that um, um, I think there's been so much um, saying that this, this is the de decade to do something about this climate crisis and the youth are awakened to that. And are they just um, creating the space for us really or listening to us and wanting to act on this thing. I think Kaluki mentioned it. Um, it's so hard to access funding. It's so hard to access the decision-making spaces that we're supposed to be part of because um, assuming, God forbid, something happened and every other person who's above the age of 35 died, we will be expected to do something. We'll be expected to make these decisions. I came to to realize that in these agreements, even a bracket means something. Mm. So how many people knew that? How many young people here know about the Paris Agreement? How many young people here know about um, the Santiago Network, yeah. the Global Shield? And these are things that we as young people, especially in Africa, we need to know about them. Because um, whether we like it or not, like we mentioned before, we are going to face the impacts of climate change. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Kaluki. Having gone to past cops as a lone wolf, you're very own Texas Ranger, and now having taken 20 years to cop, do you think things are getting better? And could you speak about also your experience? Because I remember you were struggling a lot getting you know, the young people interviews and all that. So could you, again, tie your experience to the tokenistic nature, exclusivity nature that always happens uh, you know, at cop? Definitely. Um... I think things are getting better, and I think things are always getting better. I say that um, I'm a stubborn optimist, and I think if we lose hope, we lose life, and we lose the meaning of society. So um, I do believe that it's been an improvement. Uh, this was my third cop, and um, I think if I just quickly go back to my first experience, I went to uh, COP25 that was in Madrid, and it just happening in a very during a very a uh, strong winter and um, you know, going from Africa to Europe, thinking that the heavy jackets we call uh, winter jackets would actually sustain me out there. <laughs> Only for us to actually strike um, to what was then called a food cop um, and actually say, we're not gonna eat vegetarian or vegan food. We are going to eat African food and we're going to eat animal-based protein because we needed the energy. So it was really challenging from that perspective. But also in the sense that, like Barbara said, you know, trying to navigate the systems, understanding what the difference between a blue zone and a green zone, right? It's not like they even marked green or blue. And then who actually gets access to this? You know, turns out that the first time I had this NGO badge, and then it could not allow me to go to the blue zone, into the negotiation zone. So it becomes really hard for first timers to navigate the co-op space. But I think it's important because out of that experience and challenge, then you get the information to go back to your constituents, your organizations, or the youth, and actually tell them how the experience was and, and why it matters for us to engage in such uh, processes. My second COP uh, in Glasgow, COP26, was just much better. I think we had enough time, uh, thank COVID, sorry to say. But I think the two years in the climate perspective gave people enough time to research about the climate negotiation process, what are the issues that people were negotiating or planning for, and how you can then again adjust yourself as a member of a delegation to meaningfully engage. I do feel COP26 for me was much better than COP25. And then last year in Sharm El Sheikh, it was grand because at least I've been in two COPs before. But again, it was a new challenge because I've not been a delegation lead before. I've not taken even one youth before. So I think, you know, having these expectations and trying to actually match up to the standards, working with global media, working with NGOs, working with funders, working at times even with countries to secure the youth, their budgets was really, it was quite an experience. And I think that that's needed because then if we don't actually fight for the space as young people, I don't think anyone will come to our refuge. We just need to be daring enough. Um, I think my good friend Bulimo and Orieni so the proposal that you went uh, into, and honestly, I think it just takes the courage to set up such systems and just convince them that, you know what, we are ready for the, gem, for the game, bring your action, bring your money. Um, of course, Keen is not registered, 
And, and so I think it's a big thing for us to get such a big funding uh, without registration status. And it goes to how do we as young people also have that authenticity and diligence and leadership that will have an ethic that can always guide us in the climate um, leadership space. And, and to that, I would say, of course, it was a good experience. We brought the youth, the statement is out there, and we do look forward to actually seeing how we can partner more with groups and taking more young people to COP27 in Dubai, which I foresee will be a very energy focused COP. And just who knows, maybe the caravan is happening again this year. So, right, the caravan should happen. Lots of stubborn optimism in that uh, in that response. Thank you very much, Kaluki. And I want to go back to you, Barbara, Madam Negotiations. What were the significant outcomes of COP? And then please break it down as much as possible. You talked about, you know, the Santiago network, all those things. What were the significant outcomes coming out of COP? So I will try and make it brief. Um, well, I think I've mentioned it before. You can't follow up on everything. So I'll also try and maybe just mention the things that I was following up on. Um, I think the first one was... Um, um, let me start with the CVF and the Global Shield. So the CVF means um, Climate Vulnerable Forum, and it also comprises of the V20, which are the 20 vulnerable. It was made with, um, it started with the 20 vulnerable countries, and Kenya is one of them. So um, so um, the first one was um, establishment of the Global Shield together with the Climate Vulnerable Forum. To, it's basically just a protection fund so um, it focuses on like um, protecting these vulnerable countries on the impacts of loss and damage. And um, loss and damage was like the main thing or the main focus. And I think the campaign was, uh, I think, well, the campaign was <laughs> um, payment overdue. Um, so it was mostly um, encouraging the, 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 the countries that are causing the, the most impacts of the climate the, or contributing the most in terms of emissions to... Um, pay up in terms of um, loss and damage. Um, the next thing was um, the Santiago Network. I remember, I think, being in the room when it was being operationalized and the resilience and how um, the Africa group of negotiators were really um, stunned and assertive. And they said, we are not going to leave until a decision has been made. And that was a really big step. Um, so the Santiago Network is also, um, um, how am I supposed to call it? And, it's also um, an operation, for lack of a better word, an operation just to make sure that um, th there's technical support for the funds to get to the right people, to the right countries. Uh, and then the last one was opera opera <laughs> yes, that one <laughs> of um, loss and damage. Well, I think um, Kaluki mentioned it before, and this, he also mentioned the big gap. It was just an agreement that, yes, um, the funds will be there, I guess. But there's such a big gap in terms of the design and who's going to get what and what's going to happen. How is it going to happen? Um, is it going to be fair? So um, I think it comes down to us as, as young people. And it's also important for us to understand all these terms and all these networks and how they work. Because um, eventually, one way or another, they're going to trickle down to you. I, I want to stay with you and I want to ask that, you know, you talked about the big words that I used, all those things. So how did you navigate that? And how can a young person who did not go to COP get all this information in a way that would make sense for them if they don't have someone to keep explaining these things to them? Well, um, so how did I navigate? I think um, at first we had a, a mini training, of course, it was a one day training and it was not enough because I realized that I had about this Santiago network while at COP. Um, some of these times you also get to know them um, as time goes by. And I think it's all about keeping an open mind and also wanting to know what all these things mean. Because some of them, even if I start come and start explaining to you what um, everything means, I probably won't have enough time. And by the time I finish the last, you'd have forgotten the first. So it's all about also going back and realizing um, and, 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 and trying to find out um, what's the difference between the Santiago Network and the Global Shield. Um, taking that time, um, doing it all at once is overwhelming because it's a lot of information, it's a lot of knowledge. But um, as, you, as you also 
try and uh, fit into the space, you also take time to also just be curious and learn about all these things. Brilliant. I don't know if Mena is still with us. Mena, are you still with us? Yes. Brilliant. So could you tell me, you know, looking at COI-17 and then COP27, what stood out for you in terms of youth achievement? What were the youth achievements in that process? And what do you see as the role of youth being, you know, either strengthened or weakened as part of these two processes going into COP28? It's a very loaded question, but basically, what were the youth achievements from COI-17 and COP27? Okay, uh, for me, uh, it was the first time that I told you before. So it was a, um, I was amazed that uh, there are a lot of young negotiators in COPE, okay, especially in uh, action climate environment, which I was on. Okay. Uh, also, I. Sorry, we can't seem to hear you very well. Could you repeat that? Could you take that again? Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the internet is a little bit weak. So yes, I think uh, we, I found, or I see um, uh, activists who are uh, very strong negotiators in, in hope, okay? Especially in action climate, climate environments. And a lot of uh, in a lot of um, in a lot of uh, topics or themes there go. So uh, I think the knowledge or the experience of um, of young people there in Kobe and Koi is uh, the achievement. Uh, this is from experience. So have I answered your question, or could you please clarify it for me again? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, my, my question here is, what would you say, and, and if you could get into examples or get into specifics, what would you say were the youth achievements? What, what things do you think youth achieved uh, from COI-17 up to COP27? From COI-17 to COP? Okay. Um, there we have a lot of uh, young activists who uh, who participated in negotiations, <clears throat> as I mentioned. Also, we had uh, a great uh, youth policy statement um, that uh, was um, announced to uh, co-presidency. It was and it was considered in <clears throat> sorry. Uh, in all negotiations um, process, uh, I met, uh, let me uh, give you uh, an example or specific example. Uh, I met uh, a young lady who was at 19 in COI 17 and at NECO. She, uh, she, uh, um, she was in COI for four times, okay? Uh, and she was an uh, initiator, okay? Um, also, uh, we have in Kuwaiti team uh, the 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 children champion, and he he was a strong sixteen. Uh, so I told you it was the knowledge and experience. I think it is it is the greatest uh, achievement for them. Have I got your question? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Speaking about very practical examples of the young people who are leading uh, very practical issues yes. at COP. Uh, thank you. Kaluki, could you pick up from that and talk about you know, other youth achievements that you saw, but also um, what you think that plays out in terms of looking to the future? What does that play out for the young people? Thank you. Um, and thanks, man, man. I think I hear you on most of the things. I, I feel it's important for us to nurture the next generation of African negotiators. And what we've seen, especially last year, when the chair of the Africa Group of Negotiators, I think it was from Zambia, if I'm not wrong, 
um, we oftentimes have older members of the society. Of course, they have experience and you know they live knowledge, which is you know, understandable. They understand such technical terms like Barbara said. We are seeing this new um, like uh, change where young people are actually now being uh, inducted into um, negotiation as a young negotiator professionals. And I think that's important. We saw it at COP27 that several countries actually aid young people that were in their de delegations, some actually were lead delegates. And, and I think that's important because it empowers young people to exactly take the change that we are pushing for because they much understand as they feel where we're coming from and they are our you know, ambassadors in such negotiation rooms. I also think the opportunity for constituencies like Yungo, the youth NGOs um, being the central point to actually align our messaging and direct it to the co-presidency was a strong addition to the youth engagement, um, especially through the organizing of the children and youth pavilion. I think that was very important. It helps to bring, it helped to bring rather the youth voices into the conversation and then shape the final outcome of the statement that Yongo was delivering on behalf of the youth. Um, what, what should we do to then further uh, ensure youthful, meaningful youth engagement and active engagement in core processes? I think number one, it's important for us to also uh, join our country delegations. At times it's hard to know how to, but usually we have a national designated organization or entity. In this case in Kenya, I think it's the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. Now it's been, that's a new name, but that is the go-to ministry for us to engage on climate change related issues and ensure that we join our delegation the other thing is also of working a bit harder to secure our funds, secure budgets, and especially budgets. It's you can get enough funding, but not the uh, you know the budget. So how do you then go to COP? So I think as youth, we should work to ensure we get these uh, budgets. And a budget is like an accreditation that allows you to access the COP facility, whether blue or green zone, and that's very much important. I feel like the last bit is this kind. Of some you asked Barbara, how do we then like share or transfer this knowledge? I think having these forums helps us to understand, like for instance, what's the Santiago Network? Right now, I know there are people who are curious and they'll go and research. It starts from there, you know, get the term, know it, and then try to research on it. Um, and then go beyond that. The climate negotiation, even the biodiversity negotiation space is more like a large cake, right? In this cake, you have to pick your piece. If you don't pick the piece, the piece goes with someone else. And so you become a climate uh, tourist. You're just going to COP to Gullivant and, you know, just meet people without any agenda. So what you, you should do instead is, like, for instance, I know for some, it really mentioned a lot about the Santiago network, or this is a loss and damage. So pick that thing. If it's an adaptation, there's adaptation financing. Do you want to understand more of it? Because if you then want to compound everything, you cannot know any, everything. And then you'll be confused most of the time. And also because of the nature of negotiations, as Barbara had mentioned, at times you find most of these sessions and negotiations are happening at the same time, different halls. So of course you cannot, you know, you cannot separate ourselves or cut yourself into two or three pieces. So just find that one area that you feel based on your ex experience or background or your passion, you can actually follow through in the climate negotiation process and actually work on that. Make at least sure that you know everything about one thing and something about everything else. That way you become relevant, but also become an expert in one thing in the climate space. And I think Maybe that's one of the nuggets I'll leave you with uh, as I hope to interact with us uh, at COP28. Brilliant. Now, we are already starting to receive questions and I will come to you all to ask any questions to the panelists. And I would ask that uh, if you have a question to ask, please direct it to a very specific panelist. So if it's a question, you want to ask Kaluki, you want to ask Barbara, you want to ask Mena. But I want to start with you, Barbara, because we've gotten a question from the online audience. And this one is from an anonymous participant or an anonymous attendee who asks, do you think that they make these processes and big terms very difficult and confusing to intentionally discourage youth from being involved? Well, um, that's a very good question. Um, so honestly, I believe not. Um, being in some of the negotiations, uh, it's not because I think these terms are used 
specifically because um normally when you're trying to come up with um a global agreement. This is just not one country, it's not one person. You try to really um, um, be sensitive on the choice of words. Like I said before, even a bracket would mean something. Even a bracket would, would change the whole um, structure of a sentence. And um, sometimes it'd be like, like you're arguing over brackets, but it would, um, it makes a lot, uh, uh, that slight difference, that small thing that you think is um not important or that big word that you think might be too what do you call it yeah too too um not big words, humongous or something <laughs> um is what uh, makes these people agree it's what closes the loophole that someone would say but this could mean this so sometimes those choice of words are there for a reason and they're just there to make sure that whatever you're agreeing on is what we are agreeing on whatever we're agreeing on is what we will expect to get Mm, removing space for any confusion that there is now physical audience hello question do we have any question from the audience I have All right a question from bulimo please come come to next to me because then this is where the camera is Many thanks to the panelists. Uh, I've been following through from morning and you guys have been having very, you know, nice insights. But I, pick, I picked up something from Orieni and I think you guys have been building on it that, you know, COPE is very huge and overwhelming and the young people, you want to be everywhere at the same time, but, you know, you cannot be omnipresent. And so how then can you advise people, you know, all those who have been there and also those who are trying to you know secure spaces to go to cope how can you advise them to navigate this space so that they don't go there and feel overwhelmed someone has been there for a week or two but coming back you know there is nothing specific that they can say they have achieved because you know you are at this point but before you focus another thing before you focus you've forgotten the other thing so how do we go about that thank you hello <laughs> Thanks, Bulimo, for that. I think I'll use the same um, analogy I, I used, that the COP and climate, pretty much any negotiation is like a piece of cake. And so you have to literally identify which one is your piece, which one is your pie. And that little pie has a big contribution to the end game, right? That if you want to discuss on issues on climate finance, there's a whole focus on climate finance, climate adaptation, the Warsaw Implementation Mechanism, the Santiago Net, there's even a Nairobi work program as part of the climate uh, negotiation process. So I feel like some of these technical terms and hard jargons that we find, it can only make sense and be impactful to us if we first just try to just go back and understand where it's coming from and then what our little contribution to it is and how I want to approach it. Of course, it's a bit of capacity building. And, and I know, especially Youth for Nature has done this a lot. Obunifu as a space also allows us to come for this dialogue. So then once you know what your focus as a delegation, as a person is, then could you then organize bits of capacity building sessions that will invite the climate negotiators, a seasoned, um, uh, you know, delegates to such uh, conferences, and also our party delegates, you know, from our countries to give that pass perspective help you understand what your country's position is because again remember as Barbara said, mentioned it's not like it's one country as a, as, as a presidency that is going to decide it's like a collective of the, all the UN um, party countries and then they have to agree towards this one common agenda but of course in that one common agenda every country has their own stakes so and in every country or in every region then there's these regional blocks that also come together to put stronger uh, contribution to whatever process they are pushing at the uh, uh, COP process. So I think it's important to also organize these capacity building sessions and create the space for youth to understand what issues our countries are pushing for, our region are, push are pushing for, and how as youth we can mainstream our focus and advocacy to fit within this negotiation um, um, demand. And then finally, I think it's important for us to sort of connect with our peers. At times we realize what lang the language that government is speaking is not the government, the language that uh, the grassroots are speaking. And we understand most NGOs and youth organizations are from the point of 
the on the ground implementation and this is what is going to inform what decisions is being discussed at the grass tops right so then how do we package this connect to the peers and then take it as your single focus to cop i think from last year you saw how most people are talking about the youth action in africa just energy transition and resilience based of war on what the youth were doing on the on, on at their level so i think all these are very important and i definitely think um this could be easy hacks to help navigate, navigate the COP process. Thank you very much, Paul. Aluki. <laughs> we have a comment from an online participant, Rose, who says, thank you for holding post 27 workshop. It is helpful for many youth who did not get a chance to attend or participate to get an idea where they stand and their contribution going forward. I want to turn back to the audience for one more question from someone who did not go to COP. To Brilliant. Please come. Uh, <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. My name is Petronila Adiambo. Um, this question is for both Barbara and Haluki. Um, to reduce the ambiguity of you transitioning from, from getting um, the funding to now getting into COP, I would like I would like you to share with us how was your diary like? after receiving the funding? Because how was your diary like after receiving the funding? Because there's something you mentioned about you've received the accreditation, but again, where do you get the badge? So I'd just like to understand what was your process like from <laughs> receiving the funding, getting your visa? Did you have a passport? <laughs> for those who are first timers, you need a passport just to make, to, for anyone who is a COP28 um, prospect attendee. Yeah. Before you answer, I want to match that with a question that I've just gotten from online that says, say I want to attend COP28 this year. Where do I start? Wow. Okay. Um, great. So I think the first thing, okay, let me start from someone who doesn't know anything. You've heard about COP28 and you want to navigate. Of course, the, the experience is different for everyone. And maybe what I start with might not be what other people start with. Some people might be approached. For, for someone else, it might be looking for opportunities. And I think the first thing is mapping out um, the interest because you also have to realize that even, even fossil fuel companies go to COP. So what are your interests? What, are, what am I working on? Am I working on adaptation? Am I working on... Um, Am I, see, am I just campaigning? What, what exactly am I doing? And then which organizations are doing the same thing as I am or where do we intertwine? And then um, which organizations can actually give me accreditation because not all organizations also, also get it. So um, I think the next thing is mapping out um, the kind of people you're going to partner with. I think that's the first thing. And then the next thing would be now, um, okay, closer there, make sure you have a passport. Um, I used to tell people a while back, maybe I'm not getting vaccinated, or, uh, I'm not getting the COVID vaccination because I would die of COVID, but it's for me to be able to travel and access opportunities. And this is another thing, for most countries right now, for you to be able to travel, you need to be vaccinated. Uh, um, I think that's one thing. Another thing is um, also, um, check the requirements of a country before you travel. Um, check the culture and what they do and whether you're actually comfortable going there. And then um, say um, closer maybe to COP, say you've gotten, I think for some people it's different. Some people get funding first, then start like I got a chance, um, I got the funding first before I got a badge. So I was trying to reach out to organizations, trying to reach out to the Ministry of Environment, but I also needed a specific badge because for you to be able to access negotiations, you need a specific badge. And I also realized that the kind of badge that Kaluki would have given me might not have helped me. So um, I kept trying. So networking is also very important because I used now my networks from climate vulnerable forum to reach out to the ministry because one thing I realized the ministry is very accessible in person but getting sometimes 
getting something becomes very far away because I, I visited the ministry so many times, but unfortunately I, I, I didn't get it from my side. So I had to use my networks to, to get a badge. And I think it also happens most of the times um, have the, having the right network and that goes back to mapping your partners and networks. It might help you get that funding or get that badge. For some people, they get the badge before the funding. So it's, it's, it's um, by far, it's a two-way thing. Yeah, have I answered your question? <laughs> yes. Do you want to answer? Um, yeah, I, I think for me, and thanks Petronilla for that question. Um, I think, yeah, it's one thing to get the fund, one thing to get the badge, one thing to also get on the ground. Um, so how was it when you get, we got the funding? Number one, we already had an active project team that had literally um, like worked on all possible scenarios. And Oriani, my good friend, is one of those who really helped a lot. And, and Aita Joshua, whatever he is, Adiza and a few other colleagues from across Africa. But I think the bit of number one, understanding your issue and how you plan on doing the programmatic across the year is very important. And for us, we had known after we get the funds, the first order of business is to literally plan for the workshops, which we did successfully. Um, then there was the challenge of we are not registered, so there's no active account. So how do we get the funds come from the donor side to the uh, to closer to us? So again, finding a physical host was a challenge on its own. But but then thank God we got some foundation to host our monies, um, which was a different experience all the same that I'll not um, like dwell on. But I think that bit was very important. Then Barbara mentioned in terms of researching now who are the UN, FTPC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, accredited organizations. When you go to the UN, FTPC registry, surely there's a list of every NGO across the world that is registered. So this should be one of the your go-to places to just check and just write. They usually have the you know the NGO name, where it's based, the contact person, their email address. Most of the times, it's hard to get the phone number, but the email is there. So just do this spam emailing to them. Just Right. The beat, the thing is, it's like you're gambling and you never know. I wrote to over 500 NGOs last year, you know, and only less than 25 responded to me. It was a lot of work. It was tedious. At times you feel like despairing because you got enough funding and you cannot take 20 youth because you don't have the badge, you know, so it becomes a bit challenging. So yeah, just make sure that uh, you do write to them again, connect to your national delegation because the parties usually almost have zero limitations to how many budgets they can have. So if you can maybe, for, in, for the case of Kenya, link to the Ministry of Environment and Forestry through the Climate Change Directorate, you can actually get access to these um, budgets. At times, also working with ambassadors, offices, and their heads of delegation can secure EU budgets. Um, if you want to be a media person, think about local media, national media. They also have their press budgets. This can help you. But if you want to access the negotiation, the one direct way to get to that is having a party delegation, which is through your country. But as a, through, uh, as a country delegation or a member of the country delegation, as a youth, you cannot go striking. And if you're striking, don't put your party badge on because you're speaking on behalf of your country. And if they see you and pick it on media, you've compromised your country and Kenya will be ousted out of the negotiations, right? So usually your advice, if you get a party badge, just behave like person or someone from the party and don't go picketing, doing these things. And if you're picketing, don't have your badge on. And I think these are easy to go hacks. Of course, you need your passport. You need travel documents. You need to be vaccinated. You need to take at times your, God, what, the daily, whatever, the vaccine before you travel. I forgot that. Um, and you need to ensure that you know the living cost of that place. Just start by researching the place. What is the culture? Um, I think from last year, we had most people in the LGBTQI world, you know, hearing concerns about how Egypt is an Islamic country and how are they going to be accommodated. Of course, of that bit of, of course, we understand the laws of the land, but then we are not, we are not literally infringing on people's rights, but we just expect a certain kind of behavior. So know this country you're going, what their history, what's their culture like, and how do they operate? And the thing is, you cannot die by just trying to align with, with their ways of living for one or two weeks, right? And then going back to your busy life. So that's very important. And, and knowing how much you're asking for, if you're going as a person, 
then try to create your own budgets. At times, I remember last year with the challenge of people want to be supported, but if you tell them to send you their budget, they don't have any money or any financial ceiling they put. So how do you support these youth much as they really want to be there? So try to research you know, the living costs, how much it will require for you to be able to be in that country, and then share that budget uh, on a needs basis when the funder asks you. And then I believe you'll have a good experience um, in the core process. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Now I had room for one more question, but given that the answer, uh, the previous question has been answered exclusively, I would like to ask my panelists to give a parting shot. Mena, do we still have you? Yes, I'm here. Could you please give your parting shot, your overall thoughts as we close the session? Okay. Um, for me, it was a great uh, um, chance to, uh, to attend COP. So I hope all participants will do that inshallah soon. Um, what I highly recommend is that um, try to widen your, your network locally and globally try to be a member of Yongu and please follow the, the badges of COP28 or COI18. Um, they will have a chances for volunteers. Um, also, you, will, you might have um, a call for grants. Badges also, um, as Kaloki said, try to send to every NGO or um, uh, everyone that can help uh, can help you to give you badge or even a fund because suddenly they have a chance um, for for anyone to uh, to participate but you uh, you only need to be there and you need to let those people know you are there and you have the passion to to join effectively and cope so all the best, and I was so happy to be with you guys. Have a nice day, inshallah. Um, thank you. Uh, I think for me, uh, two things. Number one, I usually say my little big thing is giving nature a voice. Of course, we don't need to talk about nature. Nature can talk about herself, but that most people have forgotten about the role of nature in sustaining us and that we need nature more than nature needs us. And I always ask people, then what's your little thing? And that little thing matters a lot. Um, the late Professor Ngari Matai said, until you plant a tree, you water it, nurture it, and actually see it survive, you've not done a thing. And I'll say, I'll edit and say, you've not done shit. You're just talking. So the point is, if you commit to a course, just, just, just make sure you have what it takes and you literally go through the process to see each fruition and actually have the results. At times, young people are quick to despair because, of course, you understand the challenges, but my encouragement is let's, let's hone our skills, let's um, not shy away from what we are known best for, and let's find that community of practice, that network can, can help us to nurture and, and improve our leadership skills and connect with more leaders in the space. And if we do that, I believe we'll conquer in the climate and nature space. We will, of course, be uh, monumental leaders in the African soil and we will impact the climate nature discussions at the different levels that we all represent. So be encouraged and let's keep the good work going. And I hope, um, I, like I said, we have a meaningful conversation today and beyond today, we create a network to continue engaging um, in these very pertinent issues. Okay, yeah, so um, for me, I'd say um, a lot of work actually happens after the COPs. Um, the COPs are just um, the um, international engagements, but most of the work actually happens after that. So, um, and it's not going to do, to work it out on its own. We have to come together. We have to collaborate. We have to um, put our minds together because it's a big thing. The climate crisis is a big thing, very big thing, and it's really overwhelming to think about it. But when we are all, like Aluki has said, we are all doing that small thing, it, um, um, 
emerges it merges to become one big thing yeah thank you thank you that small thing merges to become that big thing and as i asha our panelists out of the stage uh kaluki there is a question here for you that i want to use as a uh, encouragement uh, that that i would like you to use as the something that pushes you every evening and and the something that pushes some of us as well the representation of youth participants seems small uh but what are the plans of ensuring participation by youth from all over kenya when such workshops happen when you know trips uh, or rather when chances of going to cop happen when chances for capacity building happen what do we need to do now thank you very much thank you for being a nice spot audience up to this point we have come to the close of the first session uh, give yourselves a digital snap we can see the guys who came late they don't know what to do <laughs> but this is a brilliant time where we shall uh, or i shall release you to go for your tea break i don't know where tea break is happening is it outside yes tea break is happening outside we shall have a, the break for 20 minutes we shall be back at 11:15 and we shall have a session on nature based solution solutions and another session on assessing climate consciousness on policies of policy statements from the multilateral environmental conferences of 2022 congratulations for making it this far have a lovely tea break as you go for tea break please try to talk to someone who went to cop and ask them a very hard question if you don't have a question to ask, please come to me. I have a very hard question that came from the online audience uh, that you need to challenge this youth for. Thank you very much. You may please leave for tea. We'll be back promptly at 11.15 a.m. Thank you.
Good after tea. Or good before midday. So morning. Good morning. Hello. How are you? Online audience, if you can hear us, please uh, react with a like or show us some love. All right, uh, it's, it's, it's yet another time. All right, how was tea? It was just tea. It was to chai, isn't it? Tango to ilikuwa chai, it was special. Nilijaribu kuenda haraka ndiyo. But unfortunately, those guys had not seen me in the morning, so they did not recognize that they needed to have given me special tea. But anyway, it is yet another time. Uh, we are a couple of minutes late. But we want to get right into the session. And this is a very, very interesting session because we're talking about stuff that uh, has been dealt with with very many cops. And a youth initiative, uh, as part of that conversation, that has been brought about by Youth for Nature, working in Kenya, and then doing some amazing stuff. But I shall not tell you a lot about it because some guy decided that he will take my job from now. So hopefully he does a better job than me. Uh, all the best to him. But uh, this is the one and only, or rather the only person wearing a Youth for Nature t-shirt, Mr. Peter Bulimo Mulamba. Please give him a digital snap. Great. Bulimo is an environmentalist. He is a community activist, climate justice activist. He went to COP. That's a thing. <laughs> I hope he remembers that he went to COP. Can we get a mic to him, please? Bulimu, uh, Niaje. Okay, let's get your mic because you sound bad. At a shy boy. <laughs> good morning, shy boy. Good morning to you, Sam. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Let me remind you of September 26th, 2022, when you got on an Ethiopian Airlines flight all the way to Addis and all the way to Cairo. And you were in Egypt for another 20 days or so. How was that experience for you? Uh, for starters, I don't think I'll ever get used to flights. Like, flights just... <laughs> they finish me, especially the bumps. Spoken uh, like a true broke man, but please go on. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the experience was very eye-opening, uh, learning uh, the whole spectrum, just right from culture to, you know, people's ways of life, thinking, and also what other young people are doing within the climate space. So I get to have a lot of perspectives to open up my mind about what is going on outside of the normal that I normally do. Uh, uh, in short, I can say that there, there's just not one way of doing things. There are many other different ways of doing and achieving the same goals that you really get to know and learn about. Absolutely. You were there for work. You were not there perambulating. Both. So how was... How, <laughs> and, that, uh, and that has to be made clear. Uh, but, you know, how was managing work, but also with the confusion? I mean, we've gotten a lot of testimonies since morning saying that no cop is a very big space, all this, you know, you get confused and all that. So how is managing work and all this stress of getting confused, moving around and so on? I can assure you, like week one was week one was hectic. And I, when you say week one, do you mean week one of Alexandria? Do you mean week one of COP? Oh, uh, I think Alexandria was more of a process leading up to COP. So yeah. we were very much focused on the 
just small scope of work that we are doing mm. that went very well, of course, trying to adapt to the new culture and way of life of the Egyptian people, trying to fit in. That was okay. But the first week of COP, mm. oh my God, that was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, is, there is a way that I was thinking mm-hmm. COP would be. Mm-hmm. Of course, I've never been to COP. Yeah. And then there is just the way that COP was and mm. the two were very much different. different. Uh, now, you know, tuning yourself to this new reality really took time. I remember between Monday and Wednesday, like I can't say I did anything <laughs> apart from just trying to understand the place, what is happening where, what is this? And by the time you know this, this is happening. Oh, this, you need the badge, you need to understand the blue, green zone, innovation zone. Mm-hmm. You need to find uh, where you're staying. I remember I used to see Jenana City 63 times and I'm like, <laughs> Uh, what's this? What is this place? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and so it, it was a whole lot of experience, yeah. but I'm glad that, you know, I was able to adapt to it. Okay. So in a brief nutshell, tell us what your session is about this session. Oh, my session is a bit controversial. Okay. And it's it's going to talk about nature-based solutions. And nature-based solutions, uh, some say it's a new concept, others feel it's an old idea, a new concept. So there's a lot of discussion around this, and uh, there are also very many issues around human rights, mm-hmm. nature nature rights, and also trying to create livelihoods around it. So it's it's a very interesting topic that I really want to hear from you know, experts in the field about mm-hmm. what they feel about it and the correct exact context of uh, nature-based solutions so that also young people trying to get into the space can you know properly align and fit with themselves within the, the discourse. Absolutely. Take it away. Over yeah. to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, hi guys again. So, our, our session is going to be. So, we are going to talk about nature based solutions and a new term in the block, nature positive. I will have two speakers. One will be in person and another one will be online. Uh, maybe the mid- comps guys could just confirm if our online speaker is ready. Amos, are you ready? Maybe you can give us a thumbs up or a nod. Yes, I am ready. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank okay. you. Great. Kaluki, are you ready? Please step to the stage. <laughs> So uh, I'll give you a short story about myself. I was like, I, I chose environmental science, of course, out of passion, but my life in campus, I was, I was a gallivanter, like, <laughs> like a person who was there, like, you know, to pass and uh, just as a transition zone. And then I, I was sure I'll figure out life, but not like in the environmental space or any other thing. But of course, in the process, I met a few people that I'll not mention names now, but I'll mention some time, that tried to <clears throat> nurture me and uh, position me within the space, told me, you know, Bulimo, you have some little potential, maybe you can try to explore it, think about it. And so in that process, uh, I happened to meet one Kaluki, and I was just trying to enter the field. And so, you know, you're trying to do this uh, bit of networking and all that. And so I reach out to Kaluki and I am told, hi, Kaluki, I've been introduced to you by this and this. And uh, I've been told you do amazing stuff in the environment space. I'm looking for an organization to volunteer with. Do you have any opportunities? And this guy called Kaluki text back. This is back in 2019, by the way. And uh, he says, hi, Bulimo, nice to meet you. Happy to take you through the journey. Apparently, we don't have any opportunities at the moment, but us and when it avails, I'll be sure to hit you up, okay? And so I'm like, okay, let's keep talking. And then a brief silent, I think three or four months. And then Kaluki reached out one day. I had forgotten about him or whatever we had talked about. And he's like, Peter, uh, you had talked about your interest in um, environment and uh, environmental matters. I think this is a very interesting uh, thing for you. We have this call for stories. Uh, We are calling for stories of nature and climate that we are going to showcase in uh, New York. And... uh, the winners we might be lucky to either get cash prizes or even an opportunity to attend the session in New York. 
And I was like, oh my God, I don't even have a pass passport. I've never told any story. I don't have any story. So like, how do I start? How do I fit in this context? But I was like, okay, because I had given, you know, they say first impression matters, right? So I, I said, bring it on. And then he shared me the opportunity. And I remember it was about a call for stories uh, for young people. So I looked around. By then I was uh, interning, uh, uh, rather attachment at an organization in, Afri in Kakamega. We were trying to implement a climate change governance project. And uh, the call directly aligned with what we were doing. And so I said, I'll submit. And uh, by then, I think nature-based solution was just a new term in the block. And it, it really interested me. And I said, I'll try to give it a, a shot because it's a new term. You know, maybe many people are not, you know, are familiarized with it. So it might give me an, an advantage. And so I, I wrote this story about nature-based solutions from my own understanding. And I told in the story that, you know, we try to implement nature-based solutions in our own, in our local context. We are doing organic farming at home. Uh, I talked about, you know, our fence is made up of, it's very organic, it's made up of trees. We don't have like uh, the concrete walls. I talked about the way we are trying to produce organic manure that we then uh, apply in our farm. I talked about the water pump that we have that we also draw water for irrigation. I also talked about my workplace and said, you know, in trying to implement this project that was trying to steer the communities towards a climate resilient uh, economic development pathway, we're trying, to, and we're trying to create this sort of a climate change fund. And so we are coming up with a mechanism where we'll be providing grants to communities to, you know, adapt to issues of climate change. And so we are encouraging communities in some of the projects that they can be doing. And a number of projects included conservation farming, you know, beekeeping, uh, bamboo growing, butterfly farming. And I listed all these things and I submitted the story. Your guess is as good as mine. I did not go through. <laughs> yeah, but uh, lucky uh, for me, or maybe not so lucky, three years later, I am here as a project coordinator in the same field. Now, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now, to you, Kaluki, based on what I said, is that nature-based solutions? If so, kindly expound on it. And if not, would you try to put context of what are nature-based solutions? Thanks, Bulimo. I think it's not every day you get to hear someone give a testimony <laughs> about someone on that there. So thanks for that story. And I'll actually assure you that if you search nature-based solutions or even nature-based solutions in Kenya, the first thing that will come on your Google search is actually Bulimo's article about nature-based solutions. And I think you can agree with them. The example is giving, or with him rather, the example is giving about uh, what his um, local interventions are and how he's actually leveraging the power of nature to restore, conserve, and ensure sustainable food production. That is nature-based solutions. Yeah? I think for, for you, Bulimo, that is definitely a nature-based solutions initiative um, that qualifies to be in the talks. And you just give the first example. And I feel before we start um, this, uh, I want to set a quick context. I think Koreani and the media team have the slight lady. So I can quickly just set the context for NBS in less than 10 minutes, and then I believe Amos and myself will, through the elbow moderation of Bulimo, go through the rest of the bits. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Bulimo, can I request if I come there then so that I can share the screen? Okay, guys, so this is nature-based solutions, the good, the bad, and the what's next. Now, all um, credits go back to Marina Melanidis, who is the founder and development director at Youth for Nature, who has kindly made this PowerPoint um, ready for us today. So next. Um, so the agenda will quickly uh, walk us through what nature-based solutions in short NBS mean. And as you will not NBS as a small B, but capital N and capital S. That's a very different definition from other kinds of nature-based solution from other constituencies. We'll also uh, go through NBS and how it links to climate change, based of the what are the risks, risks, sorry, concerns, and controversies around the term itself and its application, uh, what are the global political context around it, and then uh, 
uh, the final thing, what next mean? I'll maybe just ask a quick question. Um, who would want to explain to us or give a definition of nature-based solutions? Just one person. How do you understand nature-based solutions? Uh, well, as a good um, panelist, I would want someone to just give, just how do you understand nature-based solutions? Okay, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Lorraine Kabaka. What I understand about nature-based solutions, these are the solution derived from nature. For example, uh, you can use, let's say, plants, organic material instead of the GMO material that we are talking about uh, to grow your goods, your plants, sorry. And also what I understand about nature-based solutions, these are things that can rejuvenate uh, back in the, like say, like a circular economy, they rejuvenate back in the system, the ecosystem. Yes. <laughs> exactly, and that is it. As you see in the next um, slide, we get to define at least three different definitions of the term, and then which one that we, are talking about, but just before we get to the definitions, uh, NBS has been there for some time as Bolimo has mentioned. So if you can maybe click to get the full picture, thank you. So pretty much um, NBS started um, these whole like discussions around 20, 2008 uh, um, in one of the World Bank reports around the need to also focus and, and talk about nature, consider nature in our you know, efforts to tackle the climate crisis. Then in 20, between 2012 and 2016, IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, of course, came together through this global consultation. And as a program, they, they, they actually consulted to create a uni, universal uh, definition for the term. And around the same timing, 2014 to 2020, we also have uh, the EU, the European Union Commission, again, coming together and trying to define nature-based solutions according to their um you know focus and everything then uh again another term comes in around 2017 natural climate solutions which are the way are nature-based solutions but that tackle mitigation side of uh, uh, nature-based solutions so um that comes to be and then in 2019 where bolimo mentioned about how we managed to know about youth for nature and the call for stories uh then the united nations uh sustainable sorry united nations secretary generals um i need the slide please The United National Nations Secretary General called for, go back one slide, called for this, um, the previous slide. Um, the, the Climate Action Summit uh, that was actually happening before the COP25 in Madrid. And it centered a lot around nature-based solutions definitions and where we need to place nature. And also this conversation about nature positive started having roots uh, during this uh, particular conference in New York. In 2022, again, most of us have had UNEA came up with uh, a definition that which is like more like a buildup of uh, the IUCN NBS definition. And now 2022, both the climate uh, conference and the biodiversity conference also literally trying to leverage on the UNEA definition of uh, NBS. So next we'll see what the definitions are to help us um, understand. So the first definition is by IUCN and to them, to IUCN following the global consultation, nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems, uh, solutions that address societal challenges um, effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Of course, from what she said, at times working with nature to derive solutions um, uh, from both natural and you know modified ecosystems could be like maybe a place that you convert from a forest to a farmland, and then you want to go back to its natural former natural state. So that becomes a nature-based solution. Um, maybe you click. Two times more. This is the European definition and the UN environment uh, definition. What you see from the UN environment definition is just like a build up, a bit of addition to the IUCN definition. And it defines nature based solutions as actions to protect, conserve, and uh, restore and sustainably use and manage natural or modified terrestrial. So instead of ecosystems, they actually give terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, marine ecosystems, which address social, economic, and environmental challenges effectively and adaptively while 
providing human well-being simultaneously, ecosystem services, resilience, and biodiversity benefits. So pretty much a build-up of uh, IUCN. Next. Um, so again, I'll just ask one, uh, one or two questions. From these and from the definitions that I've given, which one do you think um, is a nature-based solution? We can just say yes or no, right, as a room. Do you think the first photo that is showing I believe this is now an ocean and under that you are seeing the, um, I think these are seagrasses and underwater ecosystem uh, that looks green and stuff. Do you think this is nature-based solution? Yes or no? Yes? How many think it's a no? So the eyes have it. So that's a nature-based solution. As um, the second photo, this looks a very beautiful, what is like either to uh, tropical forest or something like that. Do you think that is uh, nature-based solutions or not? It's a nature-based solutions, right? Um, there is slide number five. We are seeing this uh, structure that seems to be pulling and engaging what is seem seemingly a large-scale plantation. Do you think this is a nature-based solution or not? Yes or not? Depends. It depends and then it's not. So I want to or you need to just quickly tell us why it depends, and then I'll respond. I think uh, in slide five, it depends if you look at the, the things they are, are, are they deriving whatever processes they are using there from nature? Is it, is it borrowing from nature? Uh, if it's borrowing from nature and feeding back to nature, then we can say it's an established solution. But if they're using inorganic fertilizers, it's inorganic pesticides, and uh, it's not supporting biodiversity or anything there, then it's not a nature-based solution. So that's why it depends. Well, and there it goes. Gerans, <laughs> with the last one. Uh, the scientist in me tells me it's not a nature-based solution because uh, that is clearly extensive agriculture. And you cannot do extensive agriculture in an ecological way. So it's not a nature-based solution. Um, <laughs> uh, do I give a final one, then we continue? Bulimo, I think you'd be hard on me with 10 minutes. Um, but I promise to, after this, make it quick. Uh, hello, my name is Zeberio. I uh, have got a different view on that because for these nature-based solutions, they they are practiced in uh, okay. They they address the society issues. Eh? So for this one, cuts across the health could be the 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 water and all that. So looking at that picture, it could be that uh, the harvest is uh, trying to address the health matters. Yeah. So to me, somehow I've got a slight view. There it is. Thanks to the three of you. We can pull up the slides. Um, so actually, um, I do get his point. I do get his point. But the truth is, this one is um, where are the slides? Um, this one is actually what we call monoculture plantation and agriculture. It's very commercial, and um, this is a term you use that I've forgotten. But it's more mechanized agriculture and this is not nature-based solution number one you're using synthetic uh, chemicals you're actually compacting the soil and you're killing the ecosystem because of the chemicals that you're using so nothing um nature-based about it uh though in the end they're trying to produce food and you understand food is a need uh, in the world um i will maybe stop there what are we seeing on six could be nature based or nature inspired uh, at times when you talk about uh, urban infrastructure we also need to incorporate nature around buildings roads and all kinds of infrastructure so nature based solutions like comes across all these different um, angles the next one and then i'll be very quick um so what does it look like in your community we are going to discuss this through is moderation that's okay but then nature based solutions and climate change um on the next slide just maybe click until we have the full slide yeah so I, I think nature-based solutions, as we said, it's one of the contributors to solving our climate and biodiversity crisis. And of course, um, one of the ways that it does is through ensuring that we protect biodiversity from loss and therefore, therefore safeguard our own survival, our own livelihoods, and the nature that we found. It also helps to improve management practices around our natural ecosystems and 
um, the resources that we have. But at the same time, uh, NBS is a solution to climate mitigation helps also, you know, sort of restore natural cover when you talk about um, forestry and, and uh, you know, tree planting, which is actually now more tree growing. How do you use nature-based solutions to plant indigenous trees, which are the right trees, the right places, at the right place, and for the right reason? When you do monoculture of maybe, let's say, um, eucalyptus or cypress, that's not nature-based solutions. That's purely commercial, uh, single species uh, plantation. And the risk with that is um, there cannot be a nature-based solution because number one, there's no resilience, there's no biodiversity. And if anything happened, the ecosystem will just collapse. And remember, nature has a way of communicating and have, having that resilience and balance. So for monoculture, actually, it does not work. And so these are the ways that NBS connects to climate um, um, change. Um, again, we've heard of the term ecosystem-based adaptation, which of course refers to the use of diversity and ecosystem services as part of overall adaptation strategy to help people adapt to the adverse effects of uh, climate change. And I think we know adaptation is like when the climate has happened, right? The climate crisis, for instance, uh, sea level rise, then how do you ensure that communities in their uh, activities, they move towards um, activities or, or practices that will enable them to, um, you know, like just navigate around that and, and maybe planting more mangroves to protect sea, sea level rise or sea surge in case of waves and everything. So that always, becomes a key contribution to climate NBS for climate adaptation. Um, I don't know whether we're close to the end of these slides because I wanted to get the um, panel with Bulemo. So there's all this about carbon um, offsets and um, markets. We know carbon credits becomes another thing, right? And carbon and non-carbon engagements in the climate space. So how do you ensure that someone who is developing from Germany, a company that is polluting, does not just take advantage of maybe global south or developing community, country communities and just give them their corporate social responsibility profits to clean up their mess in Africa. How do we ensure that carbon credits are not being done at the expense of vulnerable communities in Africa or global developing world that are actually have done little to no contribution to, you know, uh, the climate crisis and how do you ensure that whoever is polluting actually pays the price for that and that carbon markets are not an, an excuse for them to continue polluting because they're sure that you guys are going to clean their mess, they're going to give you funding and then you can report that as that, you know, the carbon uh, emissions reduction that they are having in their strategies. So things like that. I believe what you can do, Polimo, now is maybe not finish this PowerPoint because it will be a lot more. And I believe we had a prepared session for that. But this slide will be shared with you. It walks you through then what we can do, the risk that's concerned about that, and also a bit of what Youth for Nature is doing in terms of what um, Sam mentioned, the Inuka project that Youth for Nature is implementing in Kenya. But for this and much more, I believe the conversation now will be um, what will give us more insights into it. And we'll share the slides with you later. Thank you very much. Is it almost? Thank you very much, Kaluki, for setting up a bit of context uh, and setting the pace for this dialogue. I'll be coming back to you shortly, so stay with us. Uh, right about now, we want to introduce Amos, who is uh, our speaker joining us virtually. Amos is a holder of a master's in environment and sustainability from the University of Cape Town. He has also been, he has a, a, base, a bachelor's degree in forestry from Makerere University. He currently works as a climate change and natural resources programs coordinator at Wilmart Development Foundation and is the founder of Green Trust Africa. Uh, Amos, uh, just confirm again if you can be able to. Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Thank you, Amos. Now, Amos, currently NBS has been a highlight of current restoration discourse. At APAC, it featured prominently, you know, mentioning issues around uh, community rights in protected areas. Uh, so was it as a, a topic of discussion at COP27 with several pavilions, you know, uh, being dedicated to the nature uh, dialogue and discourse. Uh, even more recently was the landmark adoption of the Cummings Montreal Post-2020 Biodiversity Framework. So Amos, maybe perhaps you can shed some light. What does this mean in policy and in practice? Is it a win for communities and for nature? Um, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question, um, Bolimo. 
And um, I also want to sincerely thank uh, Paul uh, for clarifying what nature-based solutions are, because I feel like lately nature-based solutions are getting into the, you know, the complex definition and confusion that the sustainability word has also been in, because everyone says we're doing nature-based solutions, we're doing nature-based solutions, but what actually are they? Um, before I start, I want to say greetings from Kampala. Right now it's raining here both on the people that cause deforestation and those that keep planting the trees, um, just showing us how generous nature can be and how inclusive it can be. And that is something that we want to you know, adopt today. Um, if um, Bulimo, if you allow me to first tell my personal story in connection to nature-based solutions since Youth for Nature also embraces storytelling. So, um, can you can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to share my story quickly before I go to your question. So I names my last name is Amanubo, and this name was given to me by my grandfather. Um, for long, I did not embrace the name, um, the meaning of my name. I only started embracing it recently. You know, in Kenya, I speak some little Swahili. For instance, if you have a name, if your name is called Shida Zadunia. I don't think you want to mention your name quite often when you're out there in the public. They say, oh, what's your name? Because there's a negative connotation associated with your name. So when my grandfather saw the declining productivity of our landscapes and when they started noticing that the seasons were changing, um, uh, you know, the belief is that back then it is not climate change. It is the seasons, the spirits are not favoring us. They are not uh, we need to appease the spirits. And so uh, the, the, the only solution was you either appease the spirits or, or you perish. And that's where I get my name Amanubo from. And Amanubo means we are finished. And so for long, I did not embrace the meaning of my name, but it's named in connection to the natural problems that they were facing that were threatening their livelihoods. And so I, I witnessed my community shifting from, you know, conventional agriculture, from nature-based solutions to conventional agriculture back to nature-based solutions. And so for me, it's nature-based solutions is something that has been there forever. And we are only increasingly realizing the potential that nature-based solutions actually have in uplifting the local communities, in uplifting several communities and in facing the climate crisis. And uh, partly, I would say this is also due to the fact that, you know, every time we try something that is not nature based, there are consequences. You know, every time we try something technology, we try something very different that does not mimic nature, there are always consequences. And we cannot tell this. It could be a social consequence, it could be an economic consequence, it could be, um, uh, you know, an environmental consequence. But with nature based solutions, I feel like uh, what, what I understand from them is that it, it's very difficult to tell what the negative consequences of nature-based solutions are, and they speak for themselves. And hence, their projection, you know, to 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 the to the to the international high-level events, to to APAC, to you know, the World Forestry Congress, to to the COPs. And nature-based solutions take very different forms. And I think why they're being embraced is also that. You know, they, I would say nature-based solutions have an unlimited scope. They can be applied in any context, at any scale, even at the very smallest scales of the community, even at household level. So I think this is where the, 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 the potential of nature-based solutions um, is, is, is emerging clearly to the, to the fore. And just something to say about the key topics that have emanated around nature-based solutions and how this sort of brings the local communities in. We've heard from the from these conferences, we've had the emphasis on the role of nature, nature natural ecosystems or nature-based solutions in carbon sequestration and storage, their potential for, you know, for promoting sustainable land use practices that reduce emissions and increase resilience sort of the importance of protecting bio and restoring biodiversity, as well as promoting ecosystem resilience and health and many others. And we see that if we begin to go to the grassroots communities, to the local communities, they are already practicing nature-based solutions. 
this is mainly because I, I would say this is part of their life, but also it is part of their strategic advantage because you know they are limited in terms of accessing finances to purchase modern technology, modern resources, and so on, and this scientific knowledge that comes new knowledge that comes with the use of these um, emerging solutions that are not nature-based. So nature-based solutions many times also rely on you know, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge. And these are things that play to the advantage of the local communities. And so upscaling nature-based solutions sort of helps to position local communities in a way, in a place where they can contribute to the global, you know, to the global fight against reducing in, in reducing emissions, in, you know, in carbon sequestration, in combating climate change, food security. And this is where we get the local communities in. I if 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 I hope that answers your question, but if it, it doesn't, I am happy to continue. Yeah, to a significant extent you answer my question, uh, but also I've taken up a line of uh, very much interest to me. Uh, you've said that uh, compared to other forms or other sort of solutions to the, the nature crisis, it's very difficult to find challenges within the nature-based solutions. But at the same time, nature-based solutions have, have been touted to be part of, those, part of the problem. Uh, it has perpetuated uh, land right issues Governments have used uh, the name of nature-based solutions to, you know, implement some sort of fortress approaches to conservation, you know, uh, where you deny community access to, you know, uh, nature uh, or the, the lands which they, they belong to them in the name of restoration. Again, nature-based solutions have been uh, very much featured in green, green, greenwashing and full solutions. Again, uh, we have had uh, issues around, you know, meaningful engagement of communities around nature-based solutions. So how then do we address this? Uh, we, we, we see that nature-based solutions is a very gray area. So how do, where do we create the distinction? Um, that's, a, that's a very wonderful question. I think we, we are looking at things that are already running and we just want to institutionalize them. Um, I think nature-based solution is already is already something that is that has been happening for so long. Um, if I look at um, if I look at the local communities, for instance, you pointed the issue of governments gazetting areas and declaring them nature strict nature reserves that people cannot um, go into these areas. But one one thing that I learn is, you know, policies and how policies are implemented shape a lot of things. Um, I've seen. From you know, from different studies and from different testimonies, that local communities or indigenous communities, for instance, particularly with respect to biodiversity and forest conservation, if you go to Brazil, even several other indigenous communities and these cultural communities, even here in Uganda, we've seen how they're very instrumental in promoting nature-based solutions, in upscaling nature-based solutions, in promoting biodiversity conservation and forest conservation. They're actually doing great. And so, uh, I mean, they also promote a sustainable use of, you know, the, the sustainable use of, of, of these nature-based resources locally. Uh, for instance, I see a local culture here in Uganda where people go hunting and when they go hunting, they don't hunt uh, just from a traditional understanding of, you know, sustainable use of resources. They don't hunt pregnant animals. They hunt one for their own need and how they know this animal is pregnant or not is they look at how deep the, the, the footprint is on the soil. And if it is deep, they know that this is double in one and it's pregnant, definitely. But if it's not that deep, if it's shallow, they know that this is not a pregnant animal so we can get it to feed ourselves, but we only get enough for ourselves. So for me, I think that local communities are actually doing enough. Now the problem comes in how the government implements policies and how it executes the different policies and whether these policies are local community friendly. And this brings in the aspect of governance and inclusivity, because if you're going to design policies that do not consider the perspectives and the experiences of the local communities, the needs of these local communities, then you're going to alienate them and you might even make the problem severe 
But if the strategies to promote nature-based solutions are sort of designed in uh, through a participatory approach, especially the large-scale public approaches, such as you know restoration of areas and so on, if they are designed through a very participatory approaches, and I understand that the government's interest is the well-being of the people, then there can be a very good collaboration where we come up with solutions that are actually cater for the interests of the local community and that cater for the interests of the government. The government doesn't do anything for itself per se, it does it for the people and therefore it is important to consult the people to understand what their needs are. Yeah, I like the way you say that uh, communities are value holders, you know, they are very knowledgeable, they are experts and they know how to coexist with natural uh, resources. But then again, uh, out of the way governments want to implement, formulate and implement policies, that is where the major problem comes in. And I think taking you from that is where Youth for Nature in partnership with Yungo and Jibin uh, just recently formulated the youth position statement on NBS, which tried to address some of these issues. Uh, what, what were the gaps in meaningful uh, engagement and inclusion of uh, young people and communities agenda? And so maybe perhaps to just bring you Kaluki, what, what, what was- Thanks, Bolimo, and a nice really hearing from you, Amos. Um, so I feel where Bulimo has started us off is the understanding that nature-based solutions, there is this confusion, is it a new term, is it a new concept? the survey is this data that is informing the next phase of our project. So after that, we went into a serious consultative process to also now bring these dialogues closer to young people, closer to communities and the people that are using nature-based solutions um, uh, in their spaces. And so after this, uh, of course, it took some several months and we, we, we developed an info, info brief that was to help young people understand the whole process 
Uh, and then lastly, of course, we developed this uh, global use position statement on nature-based solutions uh, that highlighted some of these gaps and some recommendations from young people. And we went to present it at the 26th uh, conference of the parties in Glasgow, which uh, launched the global youth position on nature-based solutions. And so out of that, we've actually used it as Youth for Nature to be an advocacy tool and um, an approach to showcase what good practice looks like at, uh, you know, nature-based solutions um, uh, approaches, but also what we as an organization can be a part of to really domesticate this and actually showcase on the ground how does it look like to implement true, impactful, and meaningful uh, nature-based solutions interventions for community, for our countries, and of course, for livelihoods um, where communities depend on. And, and to that effect, I don't know whether I quickly mentioned about Inuka, but Inuka is one uh, of our newest babies uh, and uh, globally that Youth for Nature is implementing in Kenya as a pilot for the next one and a half years. And we are using the IUC nature-based solution standard as a backdrop to the implementation of this, working with five youth groups across Kenya representing different uh, ecosystems um, to just understand what they've been doing um, how through the engagement on the IUCN uh, nature-based solutions standard and its associated indicators, they can then further drive impact and action on the ground, transform the livelihoods of themselves and their communities, but also create um, more opportunities for others to drive off of while taking care of nature through conservation, restoration, and active management. And then lastly, we will be engaging a multimedia storytelling component that will allow young people to literally tell the true story of what nature-based solutions look like and how we can implement it without the biases we've had, without the, you know, these gaps that we know have, been, uh, not, have not been considered before and therefore representing a new approach and perspective on how we can best implement nature-based solutions. So that's the history and the bit of the solutions that Youth Nature is trying to also implement in the space. Thank you for setting a bit of context about uh, NBS and also, you know, bringing up Rinuka as a continuation of the critical work that uh, Youth for Nature has been doing, of course, so that we have a very holistic approach to this, uh, both in policy and on the ground. But maybe just a follow-up question. Do you think, because I understand the NBS position statement has some very nice outcomes and recommendations, which have been like tracked and monitored over time. Do you think until now, some of those outcomes and recommendations are being achieved? Can you maybe give an example or two? Oh. And is Inuka a part of forming the realization of the goal? Uh, in individual countries. And we've seen this both at the African uh, Areas Congress, APAC, that happened mid last year, where we actually took the outcomes of the statement in Glasgow to Africa. How, how do Africa new then understand this whole thing? Is it even meaningful? Is it a conversation for us to have? And out of the session, we could tell that actually young people are doing several things. Communities are doing a lot of things. And there's that need to incorporate the local knowledge from indigenous communities and other knowledge holders who have been protecting these ecosystems from time immemorial, right? And now we cannot assume them just because we are trying to formalize this term, right? Um, under an institution or so. So there's, there's that. And then the bit of um, like, you know, the CBD COP15, um, I think some of us might have heard about the 30 by 30 campaign. Um, you've heard of it? Yeah? So, you know, that world leaders have agreed to convert 30% of the world's land mass and sea mass into conservation by 2030. And then the question is then how, how do we ensure uh, like land rights based injustices are not uh, implicated on the communities themselves? And how do you ensure that as youth, we showcase our leadership by speaking truth, speaking truth to power in nature-based solutions? So these outcomes of the statement actually go hand in hand to ensure that we secure the rights of the people and we advocate for policy leaders to actually consider the recommendations that we must center and include uh, communities in governorship of, and governance of these uh, interventions at the local level, and that we must ensure that it's true justice. If you are conserving it, then 
how does that look like in terms of impacting on the livelihoods and, and other services that people get from the natural ecosystems they've been protecting on. And so all these, I believe to me, Bolimo connects and, and uh, as Youth for Nature and other youth con, uh, constituencies across the, the globe have been uh, pretty much active. IUCN is a friend to some of the youth organizations, including Youth for Nature, and they've actually taken up most of the uh, outcomes and recommendations from the statement. Um, and, and I know there's some, not a consultation, some global discussions um, around the same thing. And lastly, that the statement have actually been cited a lot, including uh, the climate conference, the biodiversity conference, IUCN itself. So it shows that actually there's a discussion happening and they're recognizing that actually these were gaps that existed in the be inclusive and actually make sure everyone is on board as we will go forward into the implementation phase of nature-based solutions so that actually young people are an active component that we cannot assume or just tick their box when it comes to meaningful engagement on nature-based solutions. Thanks, Kaluki. Maybe because of time, I can just bring in Amos very uh, quickly. And Amos, one, one day, I think towards the end of last year, when I was trying to apply my visa for Egypt, I, I, I was, I don't know if it was lucky or not lucky to have had or eavesdrop a conversation. And these were seemingly, you know, people who are experts, old, uh, old people in the game, uh, very knowledgeable within the climate space. I think perhaps even uh, some of the country's negotiators. And they were pointing out that, you know, we don't like to very much engage with young people because young people are very radical. They come with this activist mentality. But above all that, young people, uh, they are very fluid and they are easily swayed. So you go with what is in trend, what is trending for the day. Is it loss and damage? We run with it. Is it climate finance? You run with it. Is, is it a NBS seed statement like Youth for Nature and uh, the other, the, the coalition for NBS, the, the way it, the NBS came up and then they took and, and ran with it. So Currently, even before we have finished, you know, addressing the critical concerns about NBS, we have this new term that has come up, nature positive. And so while we're still uh, looking at NBS, there is already a new term that, you know, is creating a buzz. We saw it in COP27 very prominently. Again, in COP15, CBD COP15, nature positive was almost like the main topic of discussion. Do you think this is the right way to go, or this is also just another buzzword that will come and go. And is there anything for youth in each? Uh, is there meaningful engagement that youth can get out of this, Amos? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bolimo. Um, can you still hear me? Because my screen has gone blank. I just need to make Amos? sure that you can. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I am here. Can someone hear me? Have we lost him? Can you can you hear me? Oh, I think I can go <laughs> as we are setting him up. And um, of course, there's that bit that there's a lot that is confusing. And by the way, to continue, I just want to note that um, this panel was not by design um, planned to be all male. So we really plan for a balanced uh, panel, I know from the organizers and just last minute changes and people could not come. So understand that we pretty much respect gender diversity. Um, I believe I hear you. Uh, just... can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can, can hear you. you. Did you get the question? <laughs> yeah, I, I got the question very clearly. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Yeah, so um, uh, Bolimo, thank you for that question. First of all, you know, discriminating against young people because of their their radicalism is a very unfair reason to give for not including young people. I think that young people have all the reasons to be radical because we face we, we in our everyday life or based on our you know activities, we actually interface a lot of these challenges about climate change, you know, about air quality and all these global environmental climate environmental challenges that are happening, they even affect our lives too, in terms of employment, in terms of making ends meet. There's so many young people employed in agriculture who are trying to make ends meet for themselves, but they are facing a very stiff resistance from the climate crisis. 
So young people come from, uh, they, they, it's not just, you know, blind radicalness, it's an informed and experienced radicalness. And we cannot have people talk, you know, young people bring their agency to the fore. And why is it important for them? It's important because this is the future that we have to live with. If the people that make the decisions now are not there in the future that has been jeopardized and we have to live in it, and we'll have to answer to the young people of our times, what we did as young people of this time in terms of making decisions now. And so I think that that is not a valid reason for me to say that you do not include young people. To be honest, I, I think that we should see ourselves as more of nature as humans. And there is, for me, nature-based solutions without the inclusion of people. And for that case, young people is a very raw deal. And the coming up of this, I don't want to call them buzzwords. Every, it's like the Zate guest of this time now. It's nature positive. Before that, it was nature based solutions, which is still on. And I want to say that these words come up, these, uh, some people call them catchphrases, whatever they want to call them. But the most important thing for me is that they play a role in keeping the agenda on the table. Just imagine they were not there and everyone was going around their day normally. There was no talk about nature based solutions. People are going for agrochemicals all the way. People are going for, you know, fossil related development. So I think that these words have an impact and the ability of young people to push them through to the minds of the people. And it starts from there. So for me, it's, it's very important to involve young people. And I do not want to discourage young people from their radical approaches because from radical approaches, we, we know there's agency and from agency, we know there's action. And when we act, things get done. Um, there's been, we've had, it's been 30 plus years since the real convention where there is diplomacy and where there's no radicalness. And until lately where we get ourselves at a tipping point, we are now trying to start embracing those drastic decisions, those radical decisions, which is not, which someone would say is too late, Somewhat optimist would say it's not entirely too late, but just imagine what if some of these radical approaches that young people bring to the fore were actually implemented in the 1992, uh, the, the Rio conventions. What if they took a radical stance from there? We wouldn't have ended in this crisis now. So yes. there is a need for agency, and this agency is what young people bring. And sometimes it comes through such words as nature positive, nature based solutions. And that keeps the agenda on the table and in the minds of the people. And I think that's a very important role that should not be in the mind that young people play. Okay, thank you. Did that answer thank your you. question? Yes, yes, it does answer my question. And I also like the way you bring it uh, that uh, we should um, embrace uh, this radicalness if at all it's going to bring out the change that we so much envision. I think because of time, I'll just invite the speakers to give a parting shot, but I also understand that maybe we have some questions from the audience. So maybe perhaps you can just write the questions down and forward to some so that uh, they can get answered in the course of the event or the day. Uh, Kaluki, perhaps your parting shot and then Amos and then we will close the session. Sure. Um, to, as I get the Parting shot, I think I just wanted to quickly remind us around the nature positive discussion. Um, actually, how it's defined or how they um like let us know about it. It's, it's like they define is is um actions to restore nature uh, in a way that we are restoring it in a regenerative way than rather than declining, right? And so the issues, of course, have been around. So what actually makes restoration work under nature positive? So if we assume that we are planting all single species or just planting trees in the whole of the world, does that then mean that's nature-based solutions? And then it's just counting the number of trees planted and added to the earth, like equivalent to restoration. And, and that's where most of the issues arise from. And of course, I'd encourage you to check out the GYBN Global Youth Biodiversity Network. They issued a statement on that around the dangers of our nature nature positive. Uh, these are conversations, I think, for another day, because it's a much deeper, but I agree with uh, Amos about 
we need that radicalization. We need young people who are radical and also being true custodians of nature. We definitely need to be uh, impacting in our own simple ways. And a lot of us are doing nature-based solutions uh, initiatives. So with whatever you have, just keep impacting it, seek more knowledge, connect with your partners, and let's see how this network can actually come up with stronger, best or good practices, and therefore guiding what true implementation looks like. Um, I'll also ask you to have more discussions. Again, I don't believe anyone is an expert. We all are learning on the go. So let's be open and embrace learning every day and, and create this uh, powerhouse of knowledge and practice on the ground that can guide what true action means on the ground. And thanks again for the session. I believe I'm ready to rest. <laughs> Thank you, Kaluke. You know, we have engaged you for a long time since morning. Amos? Yes, my parting shots, particularly for young people, youth, young professionals, and also anyone who is interested in the affairs of young people, is that, you know, nature-based solutions have an enormous potential you know, for, for, for young people to, to, to create a space for young people to contribute to a sustainable planet and also to contribute to everyday well-being, you know, through nature-based solutions, young people can get employment for themselves, they can contribute to food security, they can contribute to, you know, combating the climate crisis, they can contribute to socioeconomic development. And the beauty of nature-based solutions to the advantage of young people is that it, it doesn't need a lot um, as opposed to other forms of technology. It, it, it is cost effective. And as young people, we always say that, which is the reality, we are limited in terms of finances. So what are those things within our means that we can tap into and begin to create our own impact in the world? And one of them is plain simple, it's nature-based solutions. We can upscale it through our engagements or even just through advocacy. And even in our own lifestyles, how can we mainstream nature-based solutions? How can we do those things that mimic nature in our everyday life? So um, just to all the young people, nature-based solutions, I, for me, with no doubt, is a place to be, is a place to be for us to realize our impact, for us to contribute to more sustainable societies. And I hope that you continue with these discussions, even, even at your home, even in your schools, even in your places of work, and see what aspects of nature can you start to mimic or can you upscale in your everyday life or everyday engagements. Thank you. Hey, Amos, all the way from Uganda, Kaluki joining us in person. I think this has been a very nice conversation, Sam. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Given that Bulimo uh, started, Bulimo, don't, don't, don't go yet. Bulimo started by saying that uh, he used to believe he has very little potential. But haven't you seen great potential up here? Haven't you seen great potential up here? Now, because of that, I want to break away from the digital and tokenize this boy by asking you to give him makofi anyayo. Mnajua makofi anyayo? Ama you guys are Gen Zs. You're Gen Zs. So back then, when we were young, <laughs> Eh, makofi anyayo ni moja. One, two, three. Sawa. All right, moja. Ya bulimo. Ya mgu. Mgu. Ah, good. Thank you very much. And thank you to Kaluki. Thank you to Amos joining us all the way from Uganda. Now, I have a couple of giveaways to give. What was the full name of the panelist who had a very interesting meaning to his name? Full name and hands, please. Huh? Who was attentive? Was. Ah, no, 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 no. Yes, I want people who are not. Kuna simu up. Okay. Uh, the name of the other name of Amos. Full Am name. Amos Amanubo. We are finished. <laughs> Good.
good. All the way from Shamel Sheikh, some treats for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next question I have is, what is the meaning of nature-based solution? That one is loaded. Loaded. We have spoken about nature-based solutions for a whole hour. So what is the meaning? In your own words, see all the the words of Kaluki. Yes. Solutions to restore uh, broken ecosystems uh, derived from nature itself. We agree. Majaribu sana. What is your name? Kelly. Sorry? Kelly. Kelvin. Kelly. Kelly. Ah, okay. Good job, Kelly. You get a red and a green, meaning you remember when to stop, but when to start also. Please pass. Just just pass. Just be the uh, just be the transportation system. Thank you very much. And finally, one more giveaway for anyone who remembers what Kaluki said was the 30 by 30 campaign. The 30 by 30 campaign. Let's give the mic to her. Uh, it's how uh, either countries or regions can convert 30% of their land to conservation. Umejaribu sana, lakini, ah, muna muambia, umejaribu sana, lakini, haujafanikiwa kumalizia. Hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Benson. Yeah, so I think uh, it, uh, during the last uh, convention on biodiversity, there was an agreement uh, globally by uh, nations uh, uh, of targets. The 30 by 30 means that we need to restore 30% of land and 30% of our seas, uh, actually to ensure that uh, we can restore our biodiversity. Mm. Wrong. By 2030. <laughs> yeah, just to, I know she, she got one. So because Mesaidiana, you can sit together at lunch and discuss further the 30 by 30 campaign and how, how, how you can contribute to it further. But anyway, I want to introduce our next moderator for the next session. Uh, there is a name that Bulimo, uh, that Orieni calls this guy, but I've forgotten the name. But uh, I know it has something to do with all the way from Uganda. Huh? The light skin all the way from Uganda. Huh? Karibu sana, Aita. Please uh, make your way and choose a seat that you want to sit on. Like the very special one you are. And hold this mic. Just hold it. Now I want I want I want Aita to play a very very simple game. I want you guys to help him, okay? At the back of my clipboard, there's a word that is written. Can you see it? All right. I don't want Aita to see it. I want one brave person from you guys to stand and try to describe to Aita this word as much as possible as he tries to guess, as he tries to guess what this word is, okay? It's like heads up, but now a very informal and a very unpractical one. So who wants to start to explain? Yes, Henry, stand up. And you can't use any of the words that are here. Okay, Aita, you have to give, okay? <laughs> well, that was very bright. I did not expect that. Any idea? You can just guess any any words, and we'll keep telling you whether they're right or wrong.
No, I I was wondering. Huh? Maybe when he goes to the hospital, it goes for only two diseases. <laughs> so can someone else try to explain? Or do you want to try? No, not yet. You must get this word, by the way, before you start moderating. You must get this word. So you better start, uh, start try guessing. Anyone who thinks can explain it better, yes? So, yeah, the first one, you call it our mother, mother something. And then the next one, any value that is the opposite of any value that is below zero. The opposite of any value that is below zero. <laughs> Let us see. <laughs> if it does not get that one, we should withdraw him from his chair. Mother what? Mother? All right, does anyone think they can give him a hint in Luganda? <laughs> it might be better. Let's try one more person. Uh, it is a two-lettered word. Most people say, Two words, sorry. Uh, most people say that I'm going for a dash walk. Uh, another one for the battery, mostly the one that used to for lighting and everything. It has two terminals, honestly. <laughs> anything, does anything make sense? I seem to be to be caught up in a whole pool of thoughts that I don't um somewhere. Tell us, nowhere. tell us, Simply. tell us what you are thinking about, and we'll help you get there. What are you thinking about? I think I might have lost track of the initial question already. <laughs> you're supposed to guess a word. Everything that they are telling you, you're supposed to guess a word. It's actually two words. Yeah, the words have been written here. They have been trying to give you hints at what the words are. So she said it's two words, and the first one has to do with mother something. So mother what? And the same one, you also said that you go for a dash walk. Am I confusing you? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, Hen also said something to do with environment. Okay, Bulimo wants to uh, wants to add a hint. We have talked about it extensively in the past session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to relate to one of the hints. Mm -hmm. So somebody talked about a dash walk. Mm -hmm. And I relate a word nature somewhere. Ah, good job, good job. You've gotten the first one. Now let's look for the second word. The second word you are given, uh, first of all, a hint here saying that when you go to the hospital, you're given two results. It, like when you do a test, you're given two results. It's, it's either one or the other. And then maybe we can use that to make it even closer home. When you're told that you have COVID-19, you are COVID-19 dash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we can now seal everything right now by saying we are referring to nature positive. Good job. Good job, good job, good job, good job, good job. I will not give you a gift because you really struggled. <laughs> You've taken nine minutes of, your time, of our time to get to nature positive. But Aita, thank you very much for being here all the way from Uganda. Uh, first of all, could you tell us how your COP27 experience was? 
Okay, I should say I had a great moment of really sweating, but thanks that moment is done. And COP27 came through as, as a very exciting yet really challenging moment. Yeah, a number of us were quite excited because COP27 was now coming to Africa and we thought really this was a moment for us to shine as a continent itself. And yeah, lots of expectations. And then the realities also came out. I'm excited. I was excited for the fact that a number of we youngsters, we young Africans happened to make it, especially as a Ugandan, because Because for COP26, which was my first COP, I, it so happened that there were quite fewer Ugandans. And for some moment, I was feeling a little lonely. But this time around, I happened to meet a number of them. And I think that's a great first step. And I hope maybe for the next ones, instead of we youngsters increasing in number, maybe we shall have meaningful engagement. But mm. it's a work in progress. Yeah. Awesome. Now, Aita, you're going to lead us through the next session. And just a short introduction about Aita. Aita is a wildlife biologist from Uganda, and he brings forth up to four years of engagement in international wildlife, biodiversity, and climate policy. He's a member of the IUCN, WCPA, NCUC, Global Ambassador, and Education Task Force Lead at Youth for Nature. Aita also runs a knowledge hub called Nature Wild Hub, bringing forth diversity of an African of African narratives on biodiversity conservation through science telling and storytelling. Now, Aita, you're going to lead us through the session on assessing climate consciousness of policy statements from multilateral environmental conferences of 2022. Thank you very much for being here, and you're welcome to take it away. Thank you so much, Sam Nyamwange, if I pronounced it well. Indeed, I already feel comfortable because my CV sounds big, big quite already. Yeah, so without wasting any much time, we shall get into this particular session. And with us, uh, two speakers who are to be joining online, we still have Amos Amanubo, my colleague from Uganda. And then we have Stephanie Ulivieri, who is based in Italy. And I, just, I would just like to confirm if they are present with us before we can get rolling. Amos, yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Amazing. I love the energy already. So we won't waste any, any much time and on to the first context or question. In, two, in 2022, we had a number of summits coming into play. There was the, the World Forestry Congress. We had the IUCN, the inaugural IUCN Africa Congress on protected areas. We had the Asia Parks Congress. We had Stockholm Plus 50. Earlier this year, we had the Impact 5 International Marine Protected Areas Congress. Last year, we also did have the CBD COP15. However, we are here to discuss climate. And over the past time, we realized how important climate discussions are across scales of, across scales of sustainability and broadly across scales of how we are striving hard to protect the face of the planet from the increasing disasters. So from these, from all these all these conferences and conventions are put across, it is automatic that we had, we had outcome statements. And so we'd like to know, maybe first from, from Steph, who has just joined us. So how have these policy statements from the past events? I know you attended uh, Stockholm Plus 50. So how have these policy statements from the, from the past events promoted climate resilient development and, of course, environmental governance? So Steph, you may want to take us through this first. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having here. I'm very happy for having been invited by the organizers and to have this opportunity. I'm having a little bit of camera trouble. So as soon as I can, I'm going to turn it on. Um, so I think uh, to start with COP27, but also connecting with Stockholm Plus 50, it was an opportunity for the countries to fulfill their pledges, right? And the commitments uh, for delivering the objectives of the Paris Agreement and review their climate ambition by updating the nationally determined contributions. and to also create, let's say, a work program for more ambition of, on climate mitigation. I think in Sharma Sheikh, what was really important is that the parties also worked um, on defining this global goal on adaptation in order to place adaptation to global warming at the forefront, really 
as the foremost important thing and the climate ag um, action agenda. I think it was really noteworthy that most of the developing countries were expected to make more progress, of course, on their commitment to deliver this 100 uh, billion USD annually in order to align the financial flows with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. I think building on the recognition um, of the Glasgow Climate Pact, of this urgent need, of course, for the multi-level and cooperation action, as they said, and in close partnership with these international networks, I believe there is a great need to continue advocating for a more formal role for a subnational and um, even more local governments in global climate governance. I think under this headline of Together for Implementation, um, COP27 was the ideal opportunity to give, for example, cities and regions um, the recognition that they deserve also as crucial actors in the fight against global warming and therefore apply, applying this, let's say, multi-level approach um, to climate governance. Okay, thanks so much, Steph. Uh, that sounds really quite interesting already. And uh, it has sparked some curiosity in me to now get a little more into your own your own experience. So as someone who was, of course, at Stockholm Plus 50 and later on at COP27, how do you feel these, these two conferences were connected in a way from their policy outcome statements? Steph? Oh, sorry, that was for me. I'm um, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, okay, so I can go again. Now, this is just from your own experience as, as a person, mm -hmm. you as you, as someone who attended Stockholm Plus 50 and later on COP27. So how relevant was, how relevant do you feel or how relevant do you feel the outcomes from Stockholm Plus 50 linked to COP27 itself? That's from your own perspective. To be honest, I think Stockholm Plus 50 was more of a performative um conference in a way, I think it really outlined a great failure by the international community in the sense like, okay, Stockholm plus 50. 50 years have passed since we identified a lot of the same issues that we have right now, uh, but we're not, we weren't able to tackle them or we're still dealing with them. It was also way shorter in time. So it was only two days. Plenaries and side events were um, limited in time and space. So I just felt like there was momentum that was built and brought on to COP, especially I think from the youth side, but that wasn't really reflected on Stockholm. Um, at COP, however, I also have to admit that the youth engagement on the ground was way higher. I think there were less um, youth organizations and youth activists that were present at Stockholm that wasn't such a high top level uh, item on the organization's agenda also for advocacy. So I think there was kind of a broken link there. However, um, internationally speaking, especially for example, I, when I was at Stockholm, I watched the speech of Vanessa Nakate when she was speaking to John Kerry, when she famously said, we cannot eat coal, we cannot breathe gas and we cannot drink oil. So I think there it was really like punching up um, in this, let's say climate advocacy manner. And a lot of these climate activists were also present and COP on the ground. So I don't actually see a very instrumental link, let's say between the two conferences, but more of a intangible momentum building, let's say. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Steph, for that. So we shall be getting back to you um, from another angle again. So over to you, Amos. Uh, we understand that you mainly were, were leading the youth outcome, the youth wing of the WFC. And yes, we had the youth outcome statements. We also did have the overall statements that came from the WFC. You might want to tell us a little more about that. So how do you think, maybe that's now referring to the WFC, which I know you are at the forefront. So how do you think the policy outcome statement from then uh, has been pivotal or was actually pivotal in enhancing resilient uh, climate resilient development and of course environmental governance and thank you very much joshua for that question um just to give a little background um, a very brief snapshot so the world forestry congress happens every six years and it sort of brings the different stakeholders together to come and engage in dialogue in in discussions experience and perspective sharing on um you know on 
on forests and how to harness, you know, the, the, the potential forests to sort of um, contribute towards building a healthy, resilient and sustainable um, planet. And many times, uh, just like we talk about, you know, fossils and so on, when you talk about climate, it's also very important that you talk about forests because um, forests are both, you know, sink and a source of, you know, carbon that can either accelerate or, you know, or address the climate crisis. And so um, just little to mention in terms of how um, uh, these international events are connected and how the, the, the World Forestry Congress draws the cut. It had three outcome statements, but the World Forestry Congress sort of picked from COP26, where there was the Glasgow, um, how do I say, the, the, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and um, Behind, uh, you know, back doors, there was a lot of a lot of research, a lot of knowledge generation um, to build up on that leaders' declaration on forests, and a lot of the input from the World Forestry Congress sort of also fed into, in a way, feeds into the nature-based solutions agenda at COP25, it, uh, 27 rather, and it also feeds into the agenda that was at the CBD COP. Um, it also feeds, I mean, the, the challenge is that the World Forestry Congress is not a, a member state event, but it, it is not a member state or policy and negotiation event, but it's a dialogue um, platform, a platform for holding dialogue where people sort of share a lot of knowledge and that all that knowledge is consolidated and then it can be pushed in for member state events. For instance, a lot of these outcomes were used at the Committee on Forestry in FAO last year to inform the member states about how they can adjust their, 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 their national priorities, particularly in the forest sector, to, to, to sort of promote a more resilient um, national development. So how, how do these outcome statements feed into you know, resilient, um, resilient um, climate development. What I would say is that the outcome statement from events like uh, the World Forestry Congress bring to the fore the knowledge. It brings to the fore the science. It's also like a science policy communication event. It brings to the fore all these evidence that we need to sort of inform development plans, to inform what priorities are in terms of forestry. For instance, at the World Forestry Congress, um, the, the, the State of World Forests report was launched. And this is a very important document that the whole world needs to know. They need to know what the state of the forest is because it's a very important sources and sinks of, of carbon. And so once you know the state of forests and from the State of Forests uh, report, one of the biggest things that we know is that a, a very big challenge to um, forestry uh, and for that case to climate change, combating climate change through forestry is the agricultural sector, which is causing a lot of deforestation and competing for land with agriculture. So if you read this kind of outcome document from these kinds of events, you can begin to understand. I know that my country for development planners and policy makers, they can, okay, I know that my country is going through, agriculture is very crucial to my country, but still there is a cost to how we are advancing our agricultural development. Now, how can we make agriculture coexist with forestry so that the climate, which our agriculture also needs, is stabilized? And so I feel like this is where the outcomes are sort of interlinked and make the cut into advancing grassroots and climate, climate resilient development. Okay, thanks so much, Amos. Uh, it drives me straight to another bit, another thought that as countries, we do have nationally determined contributions. And also just to add on what Amos said, that some of these, like for example, the, uh, the recommendations from the WFC now help to advise, advise national governments on how they should, they should incorporate matters of forestry, probably matters of agriculture into their NDCs of course, now trying to ensure they engage the grassroots in implementation. Thanks so much for that, Amos. And now we shall be jumping straight to Steph once again. Yeah, so I've also, I've also said it that 
we we have policy statements that come out from from these conferences and we also do have youth statements in some in some cases for example from the IEC and APAC we had the outcome statement and we also did have the youth outcome statement and now we are getting to understand how how sensitive these policies actually are in streamlining uh, youth leadership we talk about capacity building for youth to be able to engage meaningfully in most of these spaces. And yes, Amos and Steph have already showed us how interconnected these are. But then are these, are these policies actually conscious of, of youth engagement? Do they build a capacity of we as youngsters to take on those seats we all are eyeing? So that's what we ask first. So the question goes as how sensitive are the policy statements, the ones we've been referring to, how, sens how sensitive are they in enhancing youth leadership for climate action? So you'll also be referring to maybe the conventions or the conferences you've, you've been following keenly to approach this question. Over to you, Steph. Thank you so much, Dosh. So um, tackling the climate crisis requires, of course, both ambition and inclusivity, right? So I believe while there is this increasing global momentum that acknowledges the positive role that youth can play in the climate action and SDG implementation, I think this momentum really risks being tokenistic as um, some of the policies as well. So rather meaningful engagement in climate action is needed to prevent, let's say, youth being reduced to another buzzword or to just tick off a box, you know, they just invite us there. It's like, oh, I have a person under 30, that's it. Mm -hmm. So youth participation must be integrated within a holistic view of climate uh, change governance, for example. So this would entail acknowledging that youth participation can target different dimensions of governance. So policy, politics, and polity, which roots for deeper structural changes. Um, and it also entails that we acknowledge that youth participation can occur across a broad spe spectrum of levels and stages and across uh, different sets, of course, of interactions with governments and non-government actors. So this call to include uh, children and young people, for example, was made notable progress at COP by delivering what I would call like significant firsts. So we had the first ever youth-led climate forum, which was the Sharm el Sheikh Youth Climate Dialogue that was organized by the COP27 presidency, and it kick-started the Youth and Future Generation Day. We had the first ever children and youth pavilion um, inside the Blue Zone, which was the most dynamic and creative hub at the venue, I can personally say. And it was really daily animated by youth-led side events, artworks, and live performances. And for the first time, of time ever in the history of COP, the children and youth were mentioned respectively seven and 11 times in the draft, in the final draft, which was the Sharma Sheikh implementation plan. And these articles really recognize the importance of the role of children and youth as agents of change in addressing, of course, in responding to the climate crisis. And they really encouraged the parties to include them both in their processes for designing and implementing climate policy, so I would say more holistically, at a national and international level, any national delegations, for example, for also attending these climate negotiations, which is important. So not only talking to negotiators and decision makers, but actually being one themselves. And it was also for the, uh, the first time that a COP appointed a youth envoy, which was really interesting. And lastly, I think it was also the first time, and this is one of the highlights and really important, that they agreed upon the establishment, of course, of the new loss and damage fund for vulnerable countries. Um, and children and young people have been long advocating for the establishment of this fund as well. And they were particularly vocal throughout the two weeks at COP and leading to COP that actually managed to reach this milestone decision. So as you can see, I think we are making a lot of progress, um, especially policy-wise. Um, however, a lot of the things have been already decided, right? And whoever needs to know about climate change and has the power to do something, already knows about climate change. They just need to implement what has been decided upon. Thanks so much, Steph. One key thing I've picked from there is that we have policies, but then are we taking them back onto the ground? And that's the core question. And also you did mention something about youth mentions in the outcome statements, but is it just about mentioning or it's about meaningfully involving youth or supporting them capacity building, supporting them technically, financially, mention all the avenues. 
Yeah, so the same question will be rolling over to Amos on how sensitive some of these policy statements have been in enhancing uh, youth leadership. So Amos, please take it up. Thank you, Josh, um, for the question about the sensitivity of you know these policy statements. Um, and thanks for that wonderful input from Steph. Um, I, I will begin by saying that I think after having been in this youth space for so many years, it's very easy to tell that to tell when youth are being taken for granted or not. And it's very easy. Um, sometimes it depends on how ambitious we as young people are. It, it might be very easy or difficult to sort of impress us and where we get ourselves being tokenized. So I would say that just making mention of youth in policy statements is not enough. Give a space for the youth to make their own contributions to sort of conceiving the policy statements, to building them. And then after that, the youth should follow up, should be involved in following up whether the mention of their stakes is actually being made tangible in a way because, I mean, lots of documents have been produced and a lot of international conventions and high level multilateral you know, um, frameworks. And mention is being made of youth, but what is actually happening on ground? We want to see tangible things happening. Just as you mentioned, we want to see youth initiatives being financed. We want to see capacity building. We want to see some suggestions made by young people coming on board. And we want to, essentially, we want to see that youth engagement is being institutionalized in lots of processes, right from the inception to the end of life, life cycle assessment of these, you know, these policy documents and where they end up being implemented. And I, I just want to cite quickly the World Forestry Congress, because for me, the World Forestry Congress, after having participated in several events um, and seeing the nature of what youth engagement is like, I can say that the World Forestry Congress was one of the events where I was like really impressed by the level of youth engagement, uh, not because I was, you know, leading the youth outreach and liaison, but also just viewing it from a step back. And I, I can say it and through the testimonies of other people. So what did the World Forestry Congress do uniquely to sort of mainstream youth engagement? First, there was a deliberate will to have the youth voices come on board. To, to bring youth representation to the fore. That was one of the most important things. The second thing was this will was followed by tangible actions. Youth engagement was supported at the Congress financially and capacity building initiatives were organized for the youth to easily assimilate themselves into the proceedings of the Congress. There was a very deliberate position created for youth liaison and outreach and that is where you begin to institutionalize youth engagement in the processes. Yeah, not only in the outcome, but are they there in the processes? And even in the outcome of the World Forestry Congress, there was the youth call for action, which highlighted very pertinent issues that, you know, that young people identify that need to be addressed for their engagement in the forest sector. And how did this, um, how was this youth call for action conceived, right? It was conceived through a very global, um, um, you know, global consultations uh, based in, in touch with uh, individuals and youth organizations, even at the grassroots level that share their perspectives on what it looks like, what the, the, the youth were essentially given an opportunity to define for themselves what their meaningful inclusion and participation in these processes means. And you can see very tangible things, not just, oh, we want to be mentioned in these documents, but they say we want training and capacity building, we want, we want inclusion, we want to be included in pro political processes, you know, we want decent work and career development, we want gender equality and empowerment. So these are very actionable things, they're not just document things. And now how this translated through, uh, it, the good thing is that it did not only stop at the World Forestry Congress. It moved now from a stakeholder event, a non-negotiated, non-policy event, to the Committee on Forestry, the FAO's Committee on Forestry in Rome. And while at Rome, it was moved as an official outcome of the World Forestry Congress because it had official three official outcomes. 
and this was given that status. When it reached Rome at the, at the Committee on Forestry, countries were able to look at the outcomes of the World Forestry Congress, and a number of countries impressively endorsed it, and they said they're mainstreaming it, they're going to work with mainstreaming these recommendations in their national development plans in the forestry sector. So for me, that is a commitment to move forward. It's just not in a document, but it's a step to push youth forward. And it also shows to me the relentlessness of uh, what young people can achieve if they're smart, relentless, and courageous. Amazing, really super amazing. So one thing I actually got from there is involving youth from the process moving forward. I think that is really key. And probably that's, I believe that's one of the areas we keep advocating for in each of the works we do. So we are wrapping up with this and I want to take it uniquely. So the other moderators have talked about parting shots, but I want to talk about, I want to talk about parting missiles. So Amos and Steph will be, be giving us parting missiles in this case. And it should be, I want you to give us your parting missiles of not more than 20 words. Uh, just giving out a call to action for this particular session. So 20 words are the maximum limit. This give us the money. A <laughs> okay. Um, give us the money and we'll do bigger and better. That's my call to action for the youth movement, I would say. Give us the money for the adult organizations, you know. Thanks so much, Steph. That's really amazing and short, sweet, direct precise and concise. Thanks. So Amos? I, I, I thought I thought Steph would go first so that I would have the opportunity to sort of consolidate it to, 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 to 20 words. But what I would say is that as young people, we should be relentless and never give up. I think that is, that is it. Wow. Never give up and be relentless. I guess Amos just got saved by Steph because Amos was supposed to be in the limelight first, but Steph saved him. Thanks to Steph. And of course, we are done with this particular session. And I want you all to give a round of applause to our incredible speakers who have actually been with us for quite a while. And I just want you all to give them a round of applause. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Amos, and thanks so much, Steph, for coming through for this session. We really appreciate your time and your valuable knowledge you've shared, because I think this is actually what we need. And uh, at this point, I'll be passing it back to the main moderator of today to take us through for the next session of the program. Thank you once again. A big thank you to you, Aita. Thank you for coming all the way from Uganda. We would not have made this an Africa youth caravan if we only were Kenyans talking to each other. Uh, but thank you for making it to, to this place. Uh, it is a good time to go for lunch, isn't it? Yes, are we hungry? We are? Brilliant. So we'll go for lunch uh, and then we'll come back for two quick sessions and closing remarks. As we go for lunch, we'll get, uh, because one of the afternoon sessions is going to be something around road to COP28. So, and it is gonna be a plenary session. So keep thinking about ideas of the things that we need to put in place, questions of the stuff that you need to ask people who've been to COPs before and so on so that whatever outcome comes out of this makes it a reality as we go into COP28. Sawa sawa? Sifu buwana? Kabisa. It is time for lunch. We can, lunch shall be served same place. Um, we took break, but maybe be, just before lunch, we can go to that field to get a group photo, uh, totally document this moment. And then we can proceed from there. Sawa, sawa. Cool. Uh, see you at lunch. And then sit with a, someone who went to COP. Again, ask them difficult questions. Don't fear. And then because of that, just for the next hour, I did not go to COP. Thanks.
Hello guys, thanks for your time. We're having a lunch break. See you in one hour in our next session.
Yeah. Afternoon ni. Afternoon kwa Kiswahili ni. Ya mshakinyo. <laughs> Aya. Porin, what is afternoon in Swahili? Oh, habari ya mchana. Yes. But mchana also starts early, you no? Know? Ah, hiyo ina sound kama ni asubuhi. Si ndio? Masalheri. Alasiri. <laughs> All right, good afternoon everyone. If your name is Eric and you're wearing blue, please step inside. We cannot proceed without you. We know you come from the watermelon people. Uh, Barbara, as you go outside, please marshal everyone to come back. Oh, okay. All right, again, uh, we are at the post COP27 learning and sharing event. And I just want to get a couple of views from the room to see whether we are learning, whether we are sharing, what things need to be said and done within the next two hours because we shall be closing within the next two hours. So, when I choose you, you need to tell us your name, how lunch was for you, and then you proceed to tell us what learning, what great learning you have done since morning. How was Thanks, sir. Okay. My name is uh, Ayu Mukabana. Uh, for lunch, I've enjoyed it. It was enough. For anybody who, who is angry, lunch was enough. <laughs> and that's a job on them. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. So in this meeting, uh, I think uh, I came late, but I have learned something that uh, we youth, we need to take part in uh, ensuring that our nature is very uh, is conserved and uh, taking care of our environment is uh, our mandate so we need to be given uh, the opportunities and uh, and uh, implement policies that uh, can uh, can help in conservation of the environment yes pass the mic to anyone who you want to hear their voice No problem. Utaki <laughs> askia sauti yako. Um so so far so good. Mm -hmm. Um the session has been good and uh interactive. Mm -hmm. Well, uh personally uh nimebaki nikijiuliza if I was to attend cop mm -hmm. what will be my goal or what will be the reason why I'm I'm going to cop yeah? yeah so that I cannot just go for the reason of going mm. just because other users are still attending and and just lobby uh, mm. but not go there to Galavan so probably in your talk with yeah uh, no 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 don't pass it don't pass it we want to hear your voice so you tell us your name Tell us how lunch was for you and what learning you have been making since morning. Thank you. My name is Lorraine and lunch was very delicious. And since morning, I have enjoyed the session. I've enjoyed everything that the, all the speakers have presented unto us uh, about the COP or the what happened at COP. And what I'm looking forward to is learning more how youth can be engaged through the process mm. and the way forward to COP28. Awesome. Answer the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, my name is Zeberio. 
about lunch. It was yummy, you can say. And uh, about whatever I've learned today, actually, I've learned a lot from the interaction with the colleagues and um, whatever transpired after COP. And I look forward to learning more before the end of the session. Awesome. Uh, if you can bring back the mic now. Bring back the mic to me. And Eric, what have you learned since morning? Making our show up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, firstly, I've learned about the troubles people met in Egypt. <laughs> what what they ordered online versus what they ordered. <laughs> big uh, big learning, yes. Uh, no, but most important, I think what I've really picked up for me that really stood up is the need for collaboration. Uh, not just out there, but especially among us. How can you better, how can you we help each other better. For example, the the budget issue. Mm. I realized that if we had better collaboration and coordination amongst the groups, instead of people, eh, everyone was fading for themselves. It was me and me, me and myself first before I think of anyone. I think if we coordinate ourselves better, we bring into uh, together the synergies. And uh, I think I actually like what the and uh, what Keen actually they are trying to do, the environmental action for bringing everyone. Mm like uh, forming an umbrella for everyone. Uh, if we bring our efforts together, I believe uh, we have good and better things are waiting for us ahead. Awesome stuff. I did not think you had gotten anything, but please clap for him. Good job. Good job. Now it is, it is past lunch. So I want everyone of us to stand up. I'm not going to make you do any hard activity. I want us to get grounded because we are going to have two very heavy sessions. And as I do this, uh, I will ask that the technical team, if you can go on YouTube, look for a song called Kuna Kuna. That is the song that the guest, uh, the, the next moderator, will dance to stage with. But for the rest of us, please, let's stand up. Yeah, you fell for my trap. You will dance with him. <laughs> but anyway. I want us to do something that uh, I learned some time back that is called grounding. And if you're online, please just stand where you are. So ensure that uh, you have a bit of space between your legs and, and you're totally grounded to the ground. If someone pushes you, they will have to use energy to, to pull you over. Are you grounded? Okay, I want us to move around just just where you are standing, okay? Just move around to the side, slowly to the side. Uh, my right, your left. My right, your left. Or my right, your right, okay? My right, your right. I expect you guys to go this side. <laughs> All right, move uh -huh, to the left, the other way, to the front, to the back. Just keep going round, keep going round, and show your feet are grounded, and show you're well on the ground. Try to push your neighbor, see if they fall down. And you guys don't know how to follow instructions. But anyway, have you found that song, Technical Team? Ah, moderator, don't appear like you're not the one. <laughs> Please stand up. Allah, what happened? Ah, good. Now, I hope everyone of us knows how to dance this song. All right? Thank you. 
Well, well, thank you. Sir. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. Don't blame me, I'm very full. And uh, just like you, I may feel sleepy, but I am not. <laughs> uh, so we are going to our third session, uh, actually fourth. Then uh, one session will come after this, but this session will be very brief, around 40 minutes. So we have three speakers and uh, I will be introducing them in a bit. I'll give it back to Sam if he has something to say before I jump in. Okay, thank you. So we have three speakers who are, we are going to focus on children and youth pavilion. You had it being mentioned here since morning, the children and youth pavilion, the children and youth pavilion. And maybe you're just wondering, what is this children and youth pavilion? So I'm going to invite speakers. One of the speakers is our programs and uh, comms uh, director at Youth for Nature. It's called Vinamra Mathu from India. And uh, the other two, one, we have one called Ma, Ma, Makshur Isa. Then the third one who just joined us a few minutes ago. So be ready. That's Vinamra there. Then Mashkur is, uh, is there. Mashkur is from Nigeria and Vinamra from India, so pretty diverse. And uh, as you can see, can I have Vinamra's bio here kindly? Or I can just access it personally. Yeah, so. Vinamra is the Asia Pacific Regional Director for Youth for Nature. He believes in science based research and highlighting local solutions for environmental change. Vinamra is currently a PhD candidate in the graduate program in sustainability science, Global Leadership Initiative, University of Tokyo. Vinamra has extensive professional experience working in Asia Pacific, having worked with Nature Conservancy, UNDP Asia Pacific, and Rare Conservation. Vinamra is our regional director for Asia and Pacific region. Then uh, we have uh, Mark Isa. Yeah, so Makshur Isa is an Erasmus Mundus scholar with a passion for global public health, climate change, and the SDGs. He's trained climate reality leader and uh, advocates for climate action working with the Global Environmental and Climate Conservation Initiative. Jungo, climate science, to name a few. He contributed significantly to the organization of COI 16 and 17. Mashkur was also on the team coordinating the inaugural Children and Youth Pavilion. Then the last person uh, is, uh, just a minute. The last person is called Saad Ukaz, a Moroccan youth engagement and empowerment expert, especially in health and climate issues, is, has an experience and has over 10 years experience yeah, working with the, in the climate space, uh, youth organizations locally, nationally, and globally occupying leadership and coordination positions, creating and leading movements and campaigns. Led the Inter International Federation of Medical Students, COVID-19, blood donation, and my antimicrobial resistance campaigns led the organization of the Stockholm Pacific Youth Assembly and was the coordinator of the first ever COP27 Children and Youth Pavilion. So all these are experts for, who organized 
or co-organized or led the organizing of the Children Youth Pavilion. And uh, what I can say that the Children Youth Pavilion was amazing because considering that it was the first time ever. So I'm going to confirm if they can hear me. Vinamra, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Oh, wow. Amazing. Uh, how are you? How are you? I'm very well. I've been for the session since this morning. So lots of learning um, already uh, happened. I've heard um, a lot of the stories so far, of what it was like to get to Egypt. Um, a lot of questions. So yeah, I'm excited, feeling good. Awesome, I'm feeling good here too. Uh, Mashkur Isa, can you hear me? Mashkur has been dropped in the call, I think. Um, if someone can promote him to, he's not available on the call anymore. Okay. Uh, maybe he'll join us later. Uh, Saad Ukas, are you available? Can you hear me? Yes, brother, I can hear you loud and clear. Great to be here with everyone. Amazing, amazing. Welcome. And we are very glad and pleased that you created time to join us here. So uh, we, as, uh, I will just head straight into the discussion as we wait. As we, uh, as we go, we hope that Mashkur will find time to join us because I know he's been listening also and following for quite some time now. So our session uh, three, the title is Youth, Enti Youth Engagement at COP Children and Youth Pavilion Agenda. So we are, we are going to look at how youth engaged at COP and especially at the Children and Youth Pavilion. Uh, they are going to focus on this and they are going to share insights on how uh, organizing this was, what were the challenges and successes. So before I prompt you with the question, maybe you guys can just, or I can just prompt you with the question directly because time has really gone. What did it mean to organize the Children and Youth Pavilion? So here we're going to talk about the journey. What were the challenges and wins of organizing the pavilion? Did it achieve the intended objectives? Can I repeat the question? No, we heard you loud and clear. Awesome. Uh, Vinamra, you can go first. OK, I think um, overall, the Children and Youth Pavilion had a huge impact. Um, the journey to get there was always not easy. Um, and we um, had this opportunity come up to us quite late uh, to be part of the organizing committee. And I can speak from a youth for nature point so in standpoint um, that the whole process was very inclusive and open. And this is the first time that, that a children and youth pavilion was even um, a possibility. Um, and there was funding to make this a reality. And that's where um, I think 13 other or global organizations chipped in volunteer time uh, to relentlessly go through basically starting from scratch um, and building an entire pavilion that had such a great impact. Um, we kept a very open process about uh, inclusivity and trying to be uh, fair across all uh, the entire uh, climate nature space um, to align our goals and visions um, to a global audience. Um, and at the end, I think those who were on the ground can clearly see the impact. Um, they had a space to host events, share their opinions, uh, be free and open, and also a safe space for in COP uh, for young people. Uh, thank you, Vinamra, for sharing. Uh, I'll pass it over to your sure name thing. is kind of, yeah, it's too sad. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, indeed, as Vinamra said, it was something transformational. We did start late, but when we worked together and uh, it took us a process to combine, you can imagine different youth organizations from different regions and countries and different time zones working together. So uh, that on itself was a good win of uniting young organizations and people together to work on a similar and unique agenda. Uh, so that was the first step into youth unity and uh, empowerment. And then of course we were working together 
uh, to make this happen, to make this milestone, which was for the first time, and to give people uh, some background. You know, a lot of countries have their pavilions, a lot of big NGOs who have the money have the pavilion, and youth are always there at COP, but we never had a space to gather us, to unite us, where we can relax, and especially children who sometimes get lost and get stressed. So it was important to have that space, which was uh, the pavilion. And uh, we, we were, uh, of course, uh, under some stress, especially the last period when COP was approaching and having to deal with, you know, a program of two weeks and making sure every day is more engaging than the other. And you provide space to all the young people from different backgrounds, from different, uh, you know, uh, cultures, from different uh, kind of uh, areas of interest to make sure everyone feels comfortable. And I remember we, we didn't all only limit ourselves to sessions or workshops. We were doing networking sessions. We were doing uh, songs where people can come and share their artistic innovations and uh, projects. And also we had, uh, for example, regional networking sessions where people was just uh, networking and sharing with each other. And I was there in the Africa day where we were, you know, more than 150 Africans were together sharing with each other, singing and then reflecting about the situation that young people in the continent had. And that was a good moment for me where you see your, your friends and uh, brothers and sisters there all together united. So the pavilion was definitely worth it. It was a space for us to unite as young people. Of course, there was a lot of challenges uh, coming up of, you know, we had no uh, background. Uh, it was the first time we do this. So we didn't have something to uh, be based on. So we were just, you know, doing things for the first time. Um, maybe as individuals, we didn't, you know, expect or know how the COP processes were uh, going. We had, of course, some support from some adults who technically, so that was also helping with co coordinating with the COP. So of course, we were there, young people leading it from scratch. And that was, of course, uh, a good thing because we were able to implement the vision that we wanted and the objectives that we wanted and to deliver the sessions and the space that we wanted for ourselves as young people. So that was another win uh, to have our space for us and to do whatever we want. And we were singing, like you can imagine other pavilions coming to us and being like, oh, you are very loud or you are disturbing or whatever. But we were expressing ourselves. We did artistic activities. We did, you know, non-conventional boring stuff that people usually say in conferences. It was really youth-led and youth uh, culture was there and was felt uh, in the pavilion and it was described as the most vibrant and engaging pavilion at all time. Uh, of course, it's an interesting process. Now we were able to have a youth and children pavilion in the cover decision, which means that every uh, COP host will be obliged to make the pavilion happen. Uh, so that's a big thing. It means that it's not the, the last time that this will happen. So uh, looking forward again to a new children youth pavilion in the COP28 and in future COPs. And that's a big moment for us, which means that the youth agenda will keep uh, running out. And that was one of the objectives that we're not here for one time, but we're here to create a momentum and a space for young people. And that was another objective that we were able to achieve. Another objective that we also reached is uniting young people, giving them the space to feel comfortable. Uh, giving them, uh, you know, uh, space to exchange with each other, learn about each other. You know, you come there in the pavilion, you find people sitting from the Americas, from the Pacific, from the islands, from uh, African uh, countries, from Europe, sharing with each other, reflecting. And that was, that was a very instructional moment where people got to learn from each other. And it, uh, maybe some collaborations were, were, like, uh, were given birth from the pavilion. We didn't measure that, but we made sure that uh, everyone who was there was comfortable, was happy, and their needs were, were responded to. Of course, it was not only for young people, not only for children, it was also for adults. So a lot of ministers, a lot of high-level people were there, were very surprised, were happy that young people welcomed them and give them the space to exchange. And that was another objective, um, linking young people with ministers, with high-level people, with big organizations, and, uh, you know, making that intergenerational dialogue for young people to share with the, the high-level people. Uh, I remember uh, Mia Motley, Her Excellency, the, the Prime Minister of Barbados, being there, and uh, they were calling her to be in the plenary session with the, the high-level people while she was there sitting with us and asking uh, young people to share their reflections and their recommendations with her instead of being there with the adults. 
So those moments uh, show you that there is a momentum and there is pride and there is uh, something for us as young people uh, and a role to play. So yeah, that was that was the, the pavilion. I can talk forever uh, on the pavilion and uh, what we have achieved, but let's maybe uh, keep keep the conversation going. Uh, thank you, Saad. Uh, like you shared both you and Venamra, you had a very brief time to plan this pavilion and all these challenges that you guys overcame with the uh, youth coming, like overcoming the issues of uh, not collaborating and actually partnering on this pavilion, putting up, uh, like setting up all these sessions and everything that went in, the art, the music, uh, the sessions, all these. I think it's only fair to, uh, to ask this question before I give the, uh, the mic to, to, the, to the participants. What was the what what kind of resource mobilization in not just in terms of human resource in terms of funding in terms of because I know you've talked about unity so that that clears the the question on collaboration in terms of funding especially what kind of resources did you guys need to put this or was it just all uh, there was no funding because I know uh, most of the pavilions are always paid for so how did you guys do this uh, I think. I'll give that question to Vinamra, then to Saad, I'll ask another question after Vinamra has answered this one. Thank you. Yes, I think what is interesting to note is when an idea of a first ever children and youth pavilion comes to your table, um, we basically started from a blank sheet of paper. We started from zero, trying to decide everything from what chairs will go in, what will the walls look like, who will be attending, who will not be attending, who do we want to engage? Um, and the fact that it is what we were, we are youth, but we are forgetting that it's a children and youth pavilion. So they having a children aspect to it was also very um, sort of a, a high priority for us. Um, in terms of um, resource mobilization, I think, uh, millions and millions of dollars were moved <laughs> for, for this uh, pavilion to happen. And we've been fortunate to have funding uh, for the pavilion, um, sort of a verbal affirmation at first um, for the longest time to through SIF and Saad, correct me if I'm wrong, if there were multiple partners, but um, eventually we did, were able to manage to get uh, an email chain um, sometime in November, October, I think, which would confirm that yes, this money would be um, given or like dedicated to something like a, a children youth pavilion. And just to reiterate, these pavilions are not cheap, right? So they they cost up to a uh, million dollars to put together. And I think uh, the children youth pavilion was around uh, the same amount. It was like eight hundred thousand dollars to put in a two hundred and fifty square feet of safe space, what you would say for young people to express themselves, to share their views, to have sessions. Um, and amongst that, um, we cannot discount the amount of uh, mobilization that happened from a resource, a human resource perspective. Um, I think leading up to October, we had about 800 um, EOI expression of interest, 500 I think, expression of interest that were submitted in a, in a three week period. Um, we had all the hopes to reopen this EOI at some point, just in case if we didn't have enough sessions, but that day never came. And we were so overwhelmed, a, a, a team of maybe 10 people that we had to ourselves remobilize, reorganize ourselves, and then op uh, make an opportunity of something called a Friends of the Children and Youth Pavilion. And that Friends of the Pavilion really became what the steering committee could not do with its limited resources. We are here running an organization and representing our time for an organization, uh, full-time, part-time in our capacity. But uh, what the Friends of the Children and Youth Pavilion were able to do was also a tremendous um, level of um, time and dedication and uh, uh, sort of um, involvement that helped us achieve what we were able to achieve um, when we made it to networking sessions being a possibility, meetings in that children youth pavilion being a possibility, murals being a possibility, um, and even or sessions that happened beyond the 6 p.m. deadline 
where people could stay and network and art being involved and uh, just any way and form that young people thought they could express themselves, we supported it. And I think moving forward, we would also like to do it again for COP28. Uh, so I know that there are email chains already in place. So hopefully you'll hear about it soon. But I think um, from a monetary point of view and from a, a human resource point of view, it was a tremendous achievement throughout from a volunteer based global community that came together um, and completely youth led for youth by youth. Ambassador, really. And I hear Muksha is back on the call, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you Vinamra. Uh, like Vinamra has said, as you, one thing I can take out of that is that they got the funding confirmation very late. And this is very similar to most youth, uh, youth events or youth planned uh, activities. We get funding very late towards our D-Day. You see that affects our mental health, our planning, our procurement of resources or things we need for activities. So it's incredible to see how these amazing youths did this incredible work at COP and made this happen. So to you, Saad, I think the question that I can direct to you is, with the achievement of the objectives of the Children and Youth Pavilion, what, do you, what kind of message do you think this sends to the global youth out there who are going through the same problems you guys went through while planning this and organizing this? What do you think is the message to these uh, youths who are here and those youths who are listening or who will listen to us on YouTube later on? Uh, definitely, yeah. And maybe something to also mention is that we did get funding. And one thing is we were all volunteers. So it's not like we were doing this as a full-time job. And as Vinamra said, we were working our organizations and doing that as a volunteer basis. So that also shows the level of dedication. And my message to young people here is that First, uh, if you want to change the world and make an impact, you need to unite. That's what we did uh, when making the pavilion happen. We created a space for the first time. And that space that we were able to create because we united, we regrouped all the big youth uh, representative organizations. We worked together and we told the world that we as young people, we are united. We know what we are doing we uh, are able to unite and regroup and mobilize ourselves. So if you are on the local level or national level or regional level, first thing is if you wanna make an impact and be powerful, be sound, is to unite yourself. Gather your friends, your brothers, your other groups and work together so that you can have a louder voice and more power and you know you are you are to the ground. So that's, that's number one. And that's what uh, really showed itself in the pavilion. Uh, us as young people being a strong st stakeholder there at COP. And then the second message is, of course, to start things uh, in advance. We, we, we learned a very hard lesson and we were, as an organizing team, uh, feeling that. So starting things in advance, of course, when you do things the first time, you don't know what to expect. But of course, if you're working on something, then start it uh, in advance and prepare for it. And also dream big. And that's what we, are, we, we did here is we created history. So also for you to not limit yourself to the certain conditions that you have. If you have a vision, if you have something that you want to achieve, and even if it's the first time, it's a big scale. Uh, again, dream big. And uh, that's how you create an impact. And that's how you make history is by, you know, dreaming big and aiming high and making sure uh, you are able to uh, challenge yourself and get into a territory that's not being explored before. We did the pavilion for the first time. If you want to make a conference or an event or an action for the first time, this is when uh, things uh, make an impact because nobody uh, dreamed or uh, was uh, you know, brave enough to get into that. So it's for yourself to take the action and to be brave. And then also, uh, other than uniting and working together, have allies. And Vinamra mentioned that we had the friends of the pavilion and one hand cannot clap alone. So make sure you have allies and adults are there. Of course, not everyone is uh, uh, very supportive of young people, but make sure you identify allies who are there in different spaces, who trust in your vision, who trust in what you are doing and in your you know, goal and uh, whatever uh, impact you want to achieve. 
and have them support you. So don't be hesitant to communicate. It's those people who don't communicate who fail. Opportunities are there, people are there. Uh, usually it's people not knowing about what you are doing. So if you have something going on, if you have an idea, if you have a purpose, communicate about it. Knock doors, two doors, 10 doors, 100 doors, email people, talk to people, keep attending spaces and uh, be, be vocal about what you are doing because identifying allies will help you, you know, shorten the route. If we didn't have, for example, an ally who would pay for us the $1 million or whatever, we wouldn't be able to make things happen. So it's really important to have people to support your back and to push you forward and to shorten the road for you and create opportunities for you. So that's another important lesson that we learned is that we need allies to work with us. Uh, maybe other than that, uh, any other lessons from the pavilion? I would say from my own perspective, if you want young people to be engaged, uh, make sure to support them, make sure to give them a space and uh, to really encourage them. We, we saw that for young people who were there in the pavilion, feeling comfortable, having this safe space. So it means that when you provide them a space, they thrive, they learn from each other, they grow and they are engaged. And also for people who are engaged and uh, organizing stuff. If you have a team of young people that are you know, working on something and you want them to really contribute, make sure they are rewarded. If you are uh, money and resources to reward them, that's even better. If not, make sure those young people are learning, are comfortable, are not too stressed and are recognized. Because usually this youth engagement process, we tell young people, yeah, it's good, you're making impacts, you're changing the world. But then again, you don't want young people to be like a candle burning themselves for the world. So make sure they improve themselves. They get something from the experience. They learn something. They get a new connection. They get a new opportunity. They get something out so that themselves, they are doing this and they are, you know, winning from it uh, on a personal level. So that would be something uh, really important when engaging young people uh, in different initiatives and processes. So I'll stop it there and maybe uh, give the floor for other reflections. Yeah, I think Maksur has just joined us as well. And I think uh, what I want to ask you uh, is something that was asked to us before is, what did it mean to organize the children and youth pavilion uh, in your case? Um, and what did it, what was the journey like for you? Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, it's great to be sharing reflections regarding COP27, particularly the children and youth pavilion. Um, I will say it was it was a record that was set because this was the first time that it happened and it was, as you all know, it was led by youth and this is something that we fight for. Meaningful youth engagement means that we actually take the decisions and structure everything the way we want to see it going. It was quite a tedious task, to be honest, um, because just like Saad said, everyone that was doing it was majorly volunteers and a lot of time and effort was put into structuring the program the logistics getting the venue getting the speakers um coordinating with high level speakers that were going to come into the session um the scheduling how sometimes the last minute we had to shift things around but i think all in all it was majorly successful because the team was quite flexible and we were able to support each other along the way um, but as the lesson learned, I feel next time, because this was the first time, but we've learned a lot of lessons on how to plan it better and how to make sure that the next edition, hopefully in COP28, will be much better than, than uh, COP27. But as you all know, the Children and Youth Pavilion was known as the, the energy place of the Blue Zone. Everyone, even negotiators, will come to the Children and Youth Pavilion to get re-energized because of the energy that they saw at the Pavilion. So over to you. Yes, back to you, Oriani. Can you hear us? So I think I'll take one last perspective, then we can go on. And remember, Petronilla, uh, the line Petronilla just shared from Saad. I will not repeat it. Uh, I, may I volunteer somebody? leadership. I you can introduce yourself then just share. I'm Kelly. My 
observation or uh, rather opinion is that I'm astounded by even these things that we are discussing, things like just the whole thing about youth and uh, children in uh, nature and in conservation. And when you speak about determination and uh, unity and focused, I challenge myself, have I created like enough awareness to those youth at home so that, you know, like we, we are uh, like in an organization and when we are determined, we are having a goal to achieve or rather focus, but we have somewhere, someone at home who is like, I'm determined, but in what course? And if we have created enough awareness, are uh, these organizations or uh, movements able to adopt them to even focus on something? I uh, thank you very much. Uh huh. Uh, yes, yes, Sam. Yes. So what I wanted to add is actually ask a question to the panelists and to you as well. Okay. Uh, yesterday I was at a. Uh, outcome harvesting for a project which had been planned to support women, people with disabilities and so on to uh, access digital skills and geared towards them getting employment, getting the skills that they can apply in their business and so on and so forth. And one of the things that I had is that uh, there was an intended consequence because these guys started applying the digital skills that they learned for business in their churches. Still for good, yeah, but it's it's a cons it's 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 an impact that was unintended. So I would like to ask, you know, Vinamra Saad, Mashkur, what are some of the unintended impacts that you feel the Children and Youth Pavilion had at COP27? And how does that go into building the synergy and you know the programming and the design? of the youth, of the Children and Youth Pavilion at COP28? Uh, Vinamra, Saad, and Mashkur, uh, did you hear that question? Yes, we got that question. Amazing. And I think, I think uh, if Mashkur is online, he will start with this, then pass the mic to Saad. And uh, then Vinamra, you each will have at least, uh, at most, two minutes to respond before I, uh, we tackle the the last question from me, and then the participants will have like two mi one minute e e like for two questions, then we, we wrap up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Quite insightful. I think um, unintended, I'll say the the environment that we that was created at the children in Youth Pavilion, the the possibility for you to see that their voices were being heard, for them to have a space particularly devoted to them, for them to be able to share their ideas, share their solutions, engage with high level speakers, engage with party de um, delegations that came to the pavilion and also with the COP27 president, Alok Sharma and all the other dignitaries that came there. It, it kind of gave them the impression that yes, actually youth have the power to do something. We have the power to be the change that we want to see. So going forward from COP27, from the pavilion, it kind of gave the youth the energy that all the efforts they've been putting isn't necessarily have gone to waste. Because as we saw in the at the at the closing plenary with the Sharma Sheikh implementation plan, youth and children and youth were mentioned like several eleven times. And then there was also encouragement for parties to include youth in their national delegation. So this is something that we're hoping to see in COP28. And you, because they've already had that, it's something that they can follow up on with their national governments because it's something that they'll call them to account for. That because all the party delegates were there, so we're holding you to account. We need to be there at the negotiating table, not just as a token, not tokenism, but we need to also be part of the negotiations. So moving to COP28, we hope to see a lot of youths as negotiators coming to take part in the negotiations. And the youth children and youth pavilion this year, hopefully is going to be much, much better than last year because we've learned a lot of lessons. We're going to build upon that and make sure that it's more inclusive. The space is, is more diversified. Yeah, thank you. Over thank to you, thank you much. 
Thank you, Mashkur. And as you've heard, I think that's a confirmation that there's going to be a children and youth pavilion at COP28. So whatever you do, guys, make it there. And I hope to see you there. If I don't, make me see you there. Uh, over to you, Vinamra. It's sad first. Sad yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I, I can share quick reflections before giving the floor to Vinamra. You see, as Maskor said, it's about the momentum that the pavilion was able to create. Now, adults recognize that young people are there. And then, so that was a very good uh, result for us that, yeah, we're more visible, we're present. Usually young people are there in those big conferences. Sometimes they get speaking opportunities or whatever, but then nothing concrete on the institutional level. Now, when we have a space, we're there as an equal stakeholder. So next step, as Maskor said, is having this uh, negotiation presence for young people. So that also needs a lot of work from ourselves to build our capacity and do some policy work in that sense. Another consequence is, as I said earlier, that young people and children, uh, you know, got, got to learn from each other and got to, you know, engage with each other and learn and get that COP experience that they deserved. And that's especially for first timers. You know, first timers usually get there, they are lost, so many things going on. But when they come to the pavilion, they feel home they feel that this was meant for them, that there is a space where they can get and learn and ask from other young people who are experienced to, to, to you know, kind of mentorship program was there. It was not uh, planned for by us as a team, but uh, an informal mentorship just happened. You know, people experienced taking hands of the others and helping them and supporting them and guiding them. So that uh, feeling of exchange and support between young people was, was a good practice. Uh, that the pavilion helped facilitate. And also, uh, again, the, the, another, the other unintended consequence is uh, for young people to also have access uh, to adults. And that's something that we worked on. Usually, you know, you are there at the bottom of the chain when it comes to COP. You know, there is always, you know, the high level people, the official delegates, the private sector, and then young people, yeah, they're just young people. But when you have a space and then you invite young uh, adults, and then we remember that, uh, you know, ministers were contacting us and asking if we have a free spot for them to, you know, come and speak with young people. It was kind of a trend between high level people to come and, you know, uh, speak with youth and then interact. Of course, you know, we don't want them to just do this as a trend. We want them because we need that exchange, but that was an opportunity for us. That was, you know, to show that, yeah, now they are coming for us and asking to have a dialogue with us. So that shows that, yes, uh, young people now are there and, and are present. And many, many young people surprisingly uh, had the floor to, you know, interact with their ministers. Thanks to the pavilion, they couldn't reach out to them through their national delegation, but they were there at the pavilion when their ministers were present with us having a dialogue. So uh, that was a consequence linking uh, young people with delegations and so many national delegations we were able to connect them with young people who never were able to reach out to the ministries in the in the local level maybe in their countries they couldn't connect but in the pavilion they could make that connection and hopefully they could do collaborations and partnerships in their countries so that's also another good thing that happened uh, thanks to the pavilion uh, thank you sad and uh, that was very informative i like uh there, there, there were so many unintended consequences like cripple effects and we're learning from them that it doesn't stop there. Uh, like the Children and Youth Pavilion will live as, still has consequences now because the youth who are at the Children and Youth Pavilion who interact with the ministers, the hope is that they are connecting down there and doing some work on the ground. Vinamra, over to you because we have less than three minutes and uh, Sam, will, you, will you add me extra 10 or five? Okay. <laughs> So okay, did we get extra time? It's a good session. We've got strong speakers. Uh, um, I, I tell you, I have. Oh, you got dropped. Um, but I think both speakers here with me have sort of given an example of what impact looks like, uh, down to the small scale and down to like a large, much larger perspective. Um a sense of belonging is very important when you come to COP and to stand in a space where you feel any sort of familiarity or safety or the fact that you can even see familiar faces and maybe smile at them or just 
believe that, oh, maybe I saw them in passing or like, oh, he's interested or he or she is interested in the same thing that I'm interested in. Let me connect. So that impact in some way is a little less tangible. It's impact to give someone the confidence that yes, they they belong, they rightly belong in that space and they can create maybe more opportunities for themselves. Um, they can create opportunities for, for what they represent um, and they can come together and maybe create a much bigger impact uh, eventually. So I think two things that we always hear and um, I think come up a lot is, oh, we all need to work together. Oh, we are all working in silos. We need to come together and we need to just make something happen. And I think the Children and Youth Pavilion was like a clear example of like coming together and creating impact. And Saad has given examples of ministers not wanting to be where they need to be, but hanging out at the Children in Youth Pavilion. And um, something which maybe is not good to hear is that, but it is a reality, is that we're at the bottom of the chain of level of importance. And I think in the coming years, we would like to rise on this bottom chain and we would like to be, um, I think, what youth want is the seat at the table. And this is a small step of getting the seat at the table. And soon enough, we'll have badges, we'll have the, the recognition that will bring us directly in the negotiation room, even if uh, we are still there, but we need a bigger impact. So um, I hope that answers your question about impact. Uh, and maybe in the years to come, we will have a very quantifiable, like a quotable impact as well to to say in the 10th Children and Youth Pavilion, this is our story so far. So that's where I'll leave you, Oriani. Uh, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Something happened. Technology. So as you, as you, as Vinamra and uh, Saad and uh, my school, oh, what what one thing I've I've gotten from this is that when you go to co-op, we are at the bottom chain. We are we are down there, and uh, the arrow points to the seed as we studied in primary and high school. Every important every bit of important information goes from down there, and when it comes down to us, it's just breadcrumbs. So the the goal is that in the future we are also at the negotiation table, as Mashkur said at COP28. We need to see more youths go to the negotiation. So these this year we are going for the jugular. We, are, we want to we want to be there, not to be seen, not to gallivant, but to do what needs to be done to share our opinions. At Youth for Nature, we we always have these three words. We say we educate, we equip, we equip, and we establish youth as leaders and as uh, experts because you are experts, right? And your opinions deserve to be heard there. I will give you both one minute uh, to give a parting shot. And uh, if you if you spend more than one minute, I will I will talk to you later. But uh, one minute. Saad, you can start. Ma Mashkur, uh, Mashkur can start because he came late. Then Saad, then okay. Vinamra. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much for this opportunity. Uh, I just want to reiterate that we are uh, we have the capacity to do as much as we want to to see. So coming, going forward to COP28 in the following of all the discussions that are going on, get engaged, get involved with your party delegations, go talk to your minister of environment, get into the space, make sure that people know that you are able to contribute something. And it should not just be about talking, but it should also have something to offer. So it wouldn't be like for them to reiterate that, okay, yes, youths are just talking and they just make noise, but they don't really have anything concrete. So have capacity building, ensure that you have the knowledge and expertise and you are bringing solutions, bringing them ideas that are going to be really create change and advance the drive to achieve a net zero. Thank you. Over to you, Sam. Yeah, uh, I, I second that actually. You know, it's important for us to create a value for ourselves. Uh, you know, we're speaking about young people playing a role. And our role starts from the local level, making impact, uh, engaging with the communities, doing change, and then taking those lessons 
the messages that you are young people are being able to gather from your families, from the local communities, those are the most powerful ones. If you are able to document them, take them and go to those high level events and share them with the high level people, this is where impact and inspiration comes in. And that's our role in the world is that we and uh, children and young people, we are the reminder that we keep, you know, we must keep no nagging on the old people and telling them that uh, we have, we will be inherited earth from you. So remember us, do things that will preserve uh, things for us. So let's keep playing this reminder action and let's make sure to not get too consumed in those high level spaces. And the most important priority is making impact in the local level. So combine them, uh, at least have a team, let the impact in the local level continue and progress and the high level spaces, you go there to share, to amplify, to document and to make impact. So the most important thing is to keep them going both as young people. And that's why you should unite and have a team and work together. And with, uh, as we Africans say, if we want to you know, go fast, we go alone. But if we want to go far, let us go uh, together as young people. Yes, I think very important points being raised of local action and how it can be taken up or scaled up to these high level conferences. And I think what I would like to reiterate is one of the point of having this dialogue or this workshop today is uh, both Youth for Nature and the Africa Youth Caravan and a lot of the organizations that the speakers represent are the sort of organizations that are maybe your avenues or ways to get to these spaces to bridge this gap so we are here to support these young people to be able to access spaces like cop to feel safe at spaces like cop to be uh to build the capacity and the confidence in young people to actually demand what is fair and what they want to see the future to be so hope the attendees have learned something and we're always welcoming uh, more talent, more young people to join uh, forces and um, start knocking on some doors, even if it's uncomfortable. Uh, thank you, Vinambra and uh, Saad and Mashkur for gracing us with your presence and your wisdom. I think uh, one thing that you guys have heard is, I, I have also heard it, that you need to create value in whatever you're, uh, whatever you're doing. And uh, Mashkur said that when you are engaging in this space, you must be engaged, you must be bringing something to the table, right? Uh, don't say you are the table. Uh, I know that is a saying here in Kenya that I'm, uh, I'm not bringing anything to the table, I'm the table. You can't be the table. So the thing is, we need to create value and we need to create impact. And whenever you're given an opportunity, you must show up and show that you can do more than just talk, that there's more to you than just the activist that you're doing something on the ground that Saad said, right? And there, there are always opportunities for you out there. Like Vinamra said, there is always room for talent. So if you have something to offer, reach out to Mwange is here, Bulimo is back there, there is Gerans, there is Eric Siriru, there, there is talent everywhere. Reach out and let the, the, the you can, there's always room, room for learning, right? I think uh, I'll, I would be, I'll, I'd like to thank my panelists for, for joining this session and for contributing so immensely and sharing your learnings and experiences from uh, in organizing the Children and Youth Pavilion. And to my... You're muted again, Oriani. A massive, massive thank you to you, uh, Oriani Jaffet. Uh, again, it's been a journey. We were there at the Children and Youth Pavilion. It was awesome to be there. Uh, a massive thank you to the panelists as well. Are we having a good day? We are? Shake your body if you are having a good day. Shake your body. I'll give a sweet to the person who shakes their body the most vig with the most vigor. The, the, the people who are doing stuff here. <laughs> okay. I, I have nothing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we've had a very interesting day, I think. I have had a very interesting day. Full of learning, full of sharing. 
uh, during breaks as well. I mean, we spent the entire morning talking about the outcomes of COP27, what came out, the experiences of different people. We had sessions on nature-based solutions, which is one of the things that you know really pan out, and, and especially in the global south. And we also talked about, and Aita was very graciously moderated, the session on assessing climate consciousness uh, in the policy statements from the MEAs of last year. And we have had a very interesting, I think, a lot of wisdom and nuggets from it, yeah? Uh, from the youth, uh, from the Children Youth Pavilion that was held last year at COP27. And might I say some of the things, or, or one of the unintended consequences that I was hoping to hear is the self-esteem for any young person was at COP engaging with other young people at the Youth and Children Pavilion. Because there was a lot of solidarity there. There was a lot of engagement. There was a lot of let's feel good and let's support each other. Yeah. And it continues to it continues to move on well beyond well beyond uh today. Or rather well beyond COP 27. Yeah. So now it is time to talk about COP28. Out with the old, in with the new. Yeah, we have learned with the old and now looking forward towards Dubai, COP27. What are we looking forward? Uh, and then, you know, again, uh, I, I sometimes get confused for a millennial because of uh, the things I listen to and because of the people I hang out with and so on. But when you were younger, if you used to listen to Radio Citizen, uh, you, must have a, uh, you must have had a Giriyama song that, and, and I don't have the best voice, but it was something like, Safari. Uh, I can see the old people. Safari, yeah? Safari, yeah? Ni? ni? Safari ya bamba ni? Safari ya bamba ni machero. Okay? That is basically Giriyama saying that the journey going to bamba starts tomorrow morning. Yeah? But the journey going to COP28 starts when? Now. Yes? Now. So I want to hear from some of you, you know, in thinking about COP28, what, what are the things... Again, reflecting from all the things that we've shared, all the things that we've learned today, what are the things that you're looking at going towards COP28? Anyone. And then just like uh, Orieni, whose superpower is to volunteer people, I will also volunteer you if you do not volunteer. And if I walk on my safari and it reaches you, then I have volunteered you, okay? So is there anyone who wants to talk about looking at next steps going forward? What does it look like? Anyone? Okay. Safari. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. So looking forward, we've had like 27 cops so far, right? And it's always all talk, less action on the ground. So my expectations are, are that they'll heed to our voices and start acting fast before it's too late. All right. Uh, Mr. Henry, you spoke about, you know, the, the things that you would do attending COP if you ever got the opportunity. If you got the opportunity to go to COP28, what would that look like for you? And what would you be looking for? Um, thank you. Uh, so I think my focus will be on the youth and children pavilion, specifically because I have an interest in uh, environmental education in schools, basically for children. So I would look for the practical ways that the schools could adopt if we could have a curriculum that is in line with uh, the environment and the, how we can use the 
um, we can customize the curriculum in line to the to the probably the traditional ways that are in line with the said community. Yeah. Tell us. You have the mic. Tell us. What 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 would be your expectations going into COP twenty eight? Ah, uh, okay. Um, expectations. I feel like it can be a little bit controversial, but um, I really hope that the youths who will be able to go and represent us will actively and meaningfully engage uh, with the decision makers, and not only to go there to tick the box. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking, and I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. Bulimo, having attended COP27, what would you be looking at in looking at COP28? I mean, COP28 is an energy COP. Show us the money, give us the money. We have all the brilliant ideas at our disposal. We really lack the resources to implement these ideas. So in fact, if we can just arrive there and you give us the money and we come back, <laughs> yeah that, that's it for me uh, it's not just about show us the money it's give us the money all right thank you for passing the mic tell us um thank you for this opportunity and the chance uh for me um i'd say i'd echo what gerance has said that that we should as as youths we should be at the we should also be part of the decision making because sis in your ah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah go on go on go on go on go on it is us yeah, it's us as the youth uh -huh. we are at the ground we know we know uh we feel the effect more so i feel like we should be given the chance to also be part of the decision making process not awesome. just that the decisions are made then we are, we are told what to do mm. we want to be part of the process please pass the mic to this guy i have not heard your voice this morning please introduce yourself and tell us what would you be looking towards you know after dubai what what is that expectation for you uh, thank you for the opportunity I'm called Wallace Mandela. Uh, I've been hearing you guys since morning. If you've not noticed, this is my first time here. And so if I was given the opportunity to go there, I would uh, echo, you know, there are a lot of problems that are facing. So going there is like uh, reaching the high table. Huh? So you voice your issues. Mm. And then you're given the money, you come and solve them. Mm. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, I wish COP was that easy. You go and you get some money somewhere. <laughs> All right. Now, this, this really paves way to the next conversation where we'll be talking about the road to COP28. Yes. And to lead us in this discussion or in the next session shall not be me. But shall we stand up for this person? And I love the fact that uh, it's a person who did not go to COP27. Because if you went to COP27, if you've ever gone to any other COP, then you, you have the knowledge of all the bad things that happened there. So we want some stubborn optimism. I wanted to say to this, stubborn? Uh -uh. Stubborn? All right. I'm a Nivilena Saidi on a PA. Stubborn, brilliant. Petronilla, please come to stage and give a digital first, and then a real clap, and then a stomp, and you may now sit down. Hello, everyone. I know uh, it's uh, just one hour past lunchtime. We are all feeling the heat. And the exhaustion, but we are, we, are, we are finishing up, right? And as the main speaker of the day, or the main MC of the day said, and I'll quote it in a different way, Yalio Peter to Gange. So now we, in conclusion, we are moving to COP28, right? Yes, okay. So I won't be doing this alone as I take you through road to COP28. Are you with me in the 
plane. You have your passport. <laughs> so um, I have, um, maybe I'll just by, start by introducing myself and tokenize myself. My name is Petronila Adiambo. I am a graduate, a bachelor's degree graduate in environmental science from Machakos University. Um, I'm a volunteer from Youth Green Space Action and Network Organization. And then I have my own YouTube channel called Environmental Matters Feed Sports. This is a shameless plug. You could subscribe. <laughs> so I just talk about environmental issues and matters climate change. And as one of the speakers mentioned, many a times youth lack the knowledge, the knowledge, uh, the know-how of how these things are going to run. What is the energy cop? As I've just had, what do you mean by cop being? an African co-op, so many times that you come across. So on that channel, I try to break down and tell you exactly what it is in simpler terms. So that when you're somewhere and you ask a question about energy co-op or some Copenhagen, or whatever, you know, there's so many times you get. So I try to break them down and I hope that you guys can join me in that space. Thank you. Now, so on this discussion, Road to COP28, I will be having two panelists with me who will be online. The first one will be Clara Winkler, all the way from Germany. Is she on with us? Yeah, I'll start by tokenizing her. I think I love the word. Clara is a 24-year-old feminist climate activist from Germany. She studied international law and security, specializing in climate security, from 2022 to 2020 to 22, she was on the board of the Federation of Young European Greens, steering a pan-European pan federation of 36 organizations and 40,000 young people. She led campaigns on the EU climate law, sexual consent, and the fossil fuel industry. She was the head of the Federation of Youth of Young European Greens delegation at COP26 and also participated in COP27. Um, next, we'll have Rachel, who's from Canada. After almost a decade of work with community organizations, international environmental non governmental organizations, universities, government, she brings extensive experience in meaningful youth engagement and a robust background in by youth for youth capacity building. Rachel is thrilled to engage with the growing youth for network ecosystem to create sustainable internal operations that allow the organization, its members and its communities to thrive. I hope that they are with us um, the online space. Now, finally, um, one person who'll be able to join me right here where I'm seated. Um, we have Kaluki Paul Mutuku. Do you know him? No? Okay, you'll just see him in a few. So Kaluki is a Kenyan climate activist and environmentalist working to improve youth participation in decision making around climate justice. He's a co-founder of Kenya Environmental Activist Network, KIN. He's also the Africa Regional Director of Youth for Nature. His center of attention for Africa lies around environmental rejuvenation, afforestation, organic farming, and young leadership across boards. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Honey, why are you trying? <laughs> Hello. 
Okay. All right. So we'll start by I have also another speaker, by the way. And it is the audience. Yeah. So I will expect that during this session will be more interactive. And let's all engage. And the first question will be, even as you continue to link with the online audience, is why youth? I've gone into forums where we are talking of youths, 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 be more active. Let's try and do this, do that. But why youths? Anyone? Uh, my, my name is Cynthia, and you've asked why youth. Youth, because youth are the leaders of tomorrow. I know it's a cliche term, but that, that's the actual answer. I don't believe there's any other answer apart from we are the leaders of tomorrow. We are the future. We've lost audio. Um, the first question, now that Mr. Kaluki is here with us, um, we are heading to COP28. And before I even um, proceed to you, how, I mean, who, does, who knows when COP28 is going to be held? From what day to what day? This year. Of course, it's this year. The dates? Have they been released? No? They have. Any volunteer? Yes, Peter. All right. We'll know about that as we continue. So the 28th session for the conference of parties is, will be held this year. And we are being told that youths need to be involved in these discussions. The first question, uh, Mr. Kaluki, to you is, how can we as young people engage at COP28 and all these discussions without feeling overwhelmed? Because it can be a lot, but how do you advise us to engage better at COP28? Um, thanks, Petronila. Nice to meet you. It nice. happens my mother's name is Petronila, uh, and she studied in Machakos, which is my home. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but, um, I think not, we know the dates for COP28 would be from 30th of November to the first week of December, or the second week, if I'm not wrong, um, in Dubai. And I think what you can do to prepare is literally what you are doing here, right? As we discussed in the morning, one way to avoid the burnouts and to ensure that you prepare enough to start these conversations, understand what are the key issues choose that will be forecast at COP28. And to me, I think the few key things we need to think about as youth is number one, um, loss and damage will still be a very key discussion at COP28 because last year they just announced the facility, right? We need to already be having meetings, like three of them that are proposed by the COP27 presidency to ensure that we understand how we can finance this facility and then how we have um, the disbursement mechanism to countries that need the support. So we need to also follow through the loss and damage to understand where the discussions are going to 
um, issues of energy are very important. Of course, I think it's it's not rocket science to know when you hear the COP is in, you know, uh, Dubai or Arabian countries. Of course, it's a question of energy, right? These are desert countries, and so energy becomes a key um, focus of that conference. And for us in Africa, there's that bit of the just energy transition connects our region very much. So how do we as youth in advocacy world and energy sector prepare well to address this issue, understand what our common positions are in our countries and our region, but also you know, front our own innovations. Because at the end of the day, I like what the gentleman at the back said that you know, he's ready and then seeing how he can get the money. But I feel the money does not come um, on empty hands, right? You have to show them what you have, what innovations you got, so that then innovation meets um, resource. And of course, again, it's hard to just get the money at COP, but the fact that you go prepared, you can pitch innovation and you get it. I think issues of food systems and water are equally important. Adaptation financing will be a key issue to be discussed. So all these are ways we can, again, pick that small piece of the cake and follow through with it to ensure that you are prepared alongside, of course, and getting the passports we talked about in the morning, getting sure, making sure that you know, you're vaccinated and you follow the procedures that are needed for you to register for the COP itself and you know, secure your resources to be there at the end of the day. Okay, thank you for that, Kaluki. Um, could you could I get a confirmation flow from um, Rachel if she's if she can hear me? Hi, yeah, I'm right here. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm well, thanks. And you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have a question for you. Now, I've, you have worked with, um, you have engaged and worked with different youth when it comes to capacity building. Um, how can these youth be engaged at COP28 without feeling overwhelmed? There's so much that COP28 brings and COP in itself. So how can youth better prepare themselves to be engaged at COP28? Thanks for this question. And thanks for having me here today. I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. Um, I think at a on a personal level, what young people can do is to prepare in advance. And it can be really challenging because often young people receive funding at the last minute to go to COP and things, and you're really focused on the logistics of getting there, but taking time to do things like reviewing schedules in advance, like following the organizations online that are connected to the, the things that you're interested in and looking at the sessions that they're hosting to set actual really specific goals for yourself while you're there. I think these are all things that really help young people stay focused on the ground. And it doesn't mean that you can't change what you're doing when you're there um, based on the things that are emerging or what you actually need as a person in that moment. But it allows you to, it like relieves some of the burden of like decision making on the go or information finding on the go. And it allows you to have a bit of a plan um, that you can use as a fallback if you're just like not sure how to fill an afternoon or you've kind of already decided what topics to follow, things like things like this. So it's really like the preparation in advance that I think can make a really big difference um, at an individual level. Awesome, thank you. And they always say success meets preparedness, right? Okay, so um, before I, I get to Clara, a question to you, Kaluki. Um, I had this statement last year, sometime after COP. I'll just read it out. Africa does not have a key dedicated institution for capacity development of youths on climate change. Now, um, there were conversations around how to de develop capacity of the youth because you said we need to be prepared. While you were making preparations through the African Youth Caravan, and thank you so much for making it happen for our youths who are able to represent us from, from Egypt. How was it like preparing? Um, what specific topics are you talking about in terms of preparing them for COP28? COP27, sorry. I like that you're talking about the future already. So <laughs> that, that's okay. But before.
doing on the ground, right? So we we sought to promote that African positive African narrative uh, to the global stage that communities, farmers, women, indigenous communities are actually doing a lot, and we need to center these voices. We need to show what they are doing, and that speaks to climate resilience. Um, uh, you know, in these communities on issues of just energy transition. Again, whenever we hear Africa's energy future being discussed, it's usually from non-Afrocentric folks, right? And so, to my, you know, you cannot treat an illness that you don't know the source. And at times, it does not take, like, um, an outsider to come and tell you some things that are obvious to you. So I felt like, or rather we felt for just energy transition, we needed to sustain African voices. Africa that does not have um, a lack or inadequacy of experts in the energy sector. In fact, Nairobi hosts the World Resources Institute that is focusing on a few of these things, 350.org and many other global think tanks that can actually and have been proposing technologies in energy for Africa. So of course, one of the key messages was like, how do we center um, just energy transition um, that is youth facing, Africa facing, and community facing to ensure that we are not in the same colonial and post-colonial um, slavery of always monopolizing energy and power supply and therefore resulting in what we are seeing now, right? That we can actually empower communities and mobilize finances to allow communities to decentralize or have decentralized uh, grid systems, right? Of grid systems to supply energy locally as opposed to always nationwide connections that usually fails. So that was a key thing. And of course, the last and not the least was youth action that in all our different things in Africa, surely young people are doing a lot. And there is no way we can celebrate Africa without looking at this demographic. Um, and, and the main drive for that was, you know, the world talks of data says that Africa is the world's youngest population. And I've always argued that, that you cannot plan for such a demographic without involving them. And we need to allow young people to fail, but to fail forward, we need to give them space to lead and we need to listen to them because what we see most of the times is um, we're invited to the table and at times it's just not to contribute to the agenda, to just showcase that Kaluki and Petronilla are there. So, you know, there was youth engagement, but that's not youth engagement. So we sought to also allow the space for young people to feel like equal core leaders and be in the space of um, you know, climate leadership. And so the 20 youth that were taken to COP were able to meaningfully participate at the climate negotiations. We hosted side events, we connected with um, other delegates. We literally held interviews. And I feel it's been one of the transformational things from the feedback we got from them and hoping we can have a better way to even engage more young people this year, uh, knowing that now we need the action. It's not enough that we've taken the youth to COP. Now let's look, what are they doing? How can we package this story and work with them until COP, ensuring that we don't just secure financing to take people to COP, but we secure enough to also allow them to keep doing what they're doing on the ground and scale their on the ground um, efforts. So yeah, that's the long short story about the caravan. Awesome. Resilience, just energy transition, and youth action. I'll focus right there on youth action. Um, to Clara, this question is for you. I hope she's, um, she's on. And Clara, you steered a pan-European federation of 36 organizations and 40,000 young people. How was it like mobilizing the young people to participate in such forums? At the same time, when it comes to capacity building, what are your focus points? And did you achieve your mission when it comes to involving the young people at the time? Clara? So can you hear me? <laughs> I hope. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so very excited to join you. Um, so to basically steer this organization and bring them to the table at COP26 was very powerful because it really showed that we are so many people. And I think by connecting with so many different youth organizations from so many different countries all over the continent, that's already like giving us a lot of power and a lot of credibility also when um, approaching politicians, for example, or country representatives and telling them, hey, we're representing so many people and please um, 
listen to our demands and it also builds some kind of pressure. And I think that is also, that can be even more powerful if we don't even, don't stop at the borders of the continents, but then go to like talk to people from Africa's delegations or like from the Americas. And yeah, so basically the first thing that is super important when mobilizing young people around the COP context is to basically explain all the basics of the COP negotiations because so COP uh, negotiations are a UN conference where civil society is very, very powerful. And there's so many civil society representatives there, but the whole like details and technicalities can be super overwhelming. So it's like very, very important to like make a capacity building sessions with the youth that like you want to educate and tell them like, what is the Kyoto protocol? What does the Paris Agreement say what was actually um, negotiated in the adaptation fund so that they can then, for example, um, put this into context and see whether the decisions that are then taken at COPS are actually um, in line with what the youth demands because often they have amazing names and like we are so happy that we have the loss and damage fund now but if you look in the history already when we created the adaptation fund there was the fund set up in 2001 but then only it was like active from 2006 on so basically it took years to actually have the money flow towards the different direction. And this is very important for now, for example, that we don't just celebrate, we have the loss of damage fund, but that we really create pressure to establish the, the technicalities of this fund. So yeah, I'll stop here. I think that's already a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much um, for, your, for your contribution. And the next question would be around how young people can work together. Now we all have we all have something we'd like to do, but many a times there's this saying that when you walk alone, you can you can walk fast. Please, please help us elaborate this, Kaluki. Help us here. When you walk alone, you can help us there. Sure, I'm totally correct. But I think if you walk alone, you go faster. But if you walk together. You do what? You go far. What is that? Yes, and we want to go far. The African Youth Caravan could not have managed to be at COP27 if it were not for the youths who believed in the dream and work together to be able to seek funding and attend COP. Now, how can youths build synergies or associations or work together to achieve whatever objective, whether in climate action, biodiversity conservation, which ultimately leads to climate action, how can they work together? And could you demystify the issue of working in silos or working as individuals? Because you know, maybe you want the whole plate. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so kindly Kaluki, and then I'll go to Clara and then Rachel. Thanks, Petronilla, again. And of course, there is that, um... How many of us know the story of the hummingbird by the late Professor Angari Madai? Gerans knows Henu Orieni. That's amazing. So I'll quickly answer or respond by giving that short story and then I just give a few pointers. Okay. So the situation is there is this forest that is in under fire. And um, when the fire starts, all the big animals are running away from the forest because they see they're, 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 they're not able to safeguard or evacuate, rather keep, keep out the, the, the fire. Um, but then there's this little bird, the hummingbird, that is, you know, at, at, at the top of the tree, it has its nest, and, you know, it's just wondering, what can I do? You know, we are, our ecosystem and habitat is getting lost, and, and everyone is running away from it, and no one seems to care about what has been our home. So what can I do? So in the midst of despair, the hummingbird realizes that actually have a tiny beak. And so with this tiny beak, 
um, I can actually do my own little way. So guess what it does? It just dashes, flies, goes to the water, picks a drop of water, a very tiny drop of water, and then goes to the top of the forest and just, you know, lets the water into the forest. But then literally, as we know, that does not seem to be significant, right? So the, the ant animals are like wondering, what is this to this little thing doing? Like, what can you do? You cannot do anything, right? We are powerless. Um, but this, the, the moral of the story is that even as a hummingbird, like there's always something that you can do to make the changes. Imagine an animal like an elephant with a big trunk. If it wanted to keep out the fire or you just put it out, it could have, right? There are big animals that could have saved the situation, but the forest gets destroyed because they just left it to the little hummingbird. Um, so, and the same applies to us as youth, not just youth, actually. I think it's a normal thing for human, the human species to just be mean and sort of do which, that which favors us. And it's okay, it's understandable because at the end of the day, we want to make progress. We want to achieve something. We want to make steps in our careers, in our family, in our education and everything. But the question is then to what extent if you just safeguard opportunities around yourself as a person, as an NGO, then to what extent does that go and how do you achieve more impact? So I believe it's important for us to demystify this civilization, if I can call it that way, and, and really imagine the power of the collective. It's one of the things that Keen actually has, has tried to achieve by opening the space up in Kenya and allowing belonging of not just environmental NGOs, but stakeholders and enthusiasts that I feel they actually belong to the environmental movement. They can do something about the climate crisis and contribute towards the positive change that we, we aim to achieve. So I think it's important for us to organize. It's important for us to come together. It's important for us to listen to each other. And it's important to know that we are not here to compete, we are here to complement. For with complementation, we can achieve a lot with our different skill set. But if we compete, again, we'll keep on working faster, but not going any far. We need to work together in unity. Awesome. Unity is strength. So Clara, could you help us just to um, highlight on what Kaluki has mentioned when it comes to the silonism nature of people wanting to work um, in individual perspective, but are not ready to partner to take the dream to the next level. So could you demystify that and guide us on how we could form partnerships and network as youth? Yeah, maybe I can illustrate this with an example of COP27, because basically one of our main goals as a European youth organization as COP27 was to help to establish the loss and damage fund in order to like pay reparations to the global south. And but of course, it's like super uh, tokenizing to or like to us having us ask this without talking to the most affected people and areas. And so what we did was like taking the demands from the most affected areas and people and bring them to the European leaders so that we can actually like have this power from the people that are affected and then like bring this to our leaders. But then we had like really, really good contact with our German delegation, for example. And they told us that it's actually the US who were like blocking very specific things in the loss and damage fund. So then we as European youth and Global South youth um, approached the US young people. And then they talked to their delegation to convince them to give up their position and actually worked in the end. So, um, I mean, of course, it's like all the pressure coming together and then them giving up the position, but it's like it's contributing towards this pressure. And I think this example of showing how like the United work can actually um, be successful um, is like the biggest argument to really reach out to youth from different countries and to youth from different continents. And I think um, as a practical tip, the best way to do this as a young person at COP is first to join the Yango meetings. They also have really, so the Yango is the youth constituency at COP for those that don't know. And 
they you can just google them and they have meetings in preparation of cop so there you meet people from all over the world coming to cop and then they also have daily briefings at cop and they are super helpful and then um you can also like always in the morning there are also the daily briefings from other constituencies and for example from the climate action network so if you're interested in yeah more like the energy aspect for example you could go to the climate action network and briefing and i think that is also very helpful because then like all the civil society actors talk in one room and you see who is responsible for what or who's really an expert in which topic and then you can approach them bilaterally and ask for a collaboration and i think that is has been very useful in the past and i think it's going to be very useful as well at cop 28 Awesome. The word is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. If you've left this room without anything else, I think the word that should stick is to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Now, um, Rachel, um, to you in a minute. And then let's head to the next. Rachel? Sure. Um, I can really only build on what Clara and Kaluki have already mentioned, but I think that silos are kind of like the nature of the systems that we work in and when we get to the root of all of these problems we know that the systems are the problems and so for young people to work beyond silos we have to like change our mindset and be willing to work against the status quo which can sometimes take more time and energy um but also as everyone has already mentioned it um it results in really really beautiful work and so I think it's about trying to like change our mindsets as young people and as youth led organizations to focus on abundance and opportunity instead of competition. Um, yeah, and and again, like a, maybe a more tangible example is like if you are at the table, if you are in a meeting with a funder, if you do get space at a negotiation, ask if you can bring somebody else and bring another young person with you. Maybe they're from your organization, maybe they're from a different organization. But just asking to bring to make more space, um, asking to make the table bigger is like a crucial part of this work, I think. Awesome. So I think one thing that Rachel has mentioned that has really just caught me is you can literally recognize someone's effort from afar and bring them closer so that when you it's like you recognize someone's strength and then use it, add it to your strength, the goal is achieved. Now, I've had something from the discussion since morning, energy COP. COP28 seems to be an energy COP. So what is that all about, Kaluki? Well, well I think I'm being, being put on the hot seat. <laughs> um, so I'll only give what I know. I, and I think one of the key issues is um, it being an energy corp, there's that bit of, we know the United Arab Emirates have, of course, developed and gotten to where they are today because of the uh, fossil fuel resources that they have, right? So then the, the nature of it being uh, proposed and set up as the next presidency and host of the climate conference means we cannot run away from these energy discussions. And of course, the bit of without oil and gas, then the UAE could not be where it is today. At the same time, we know the, the, the climate crisis is impacting here and now, and, and we need to think about the future uh, of energy resource and then energy usage across the world. So then this becomes a heated debate that will be, you know, shaping the, the agenda discussions at COP28. Uh, so I do think that's that's one of the key issues to focus on. And it's not just energy. Energy becomes at the top, but there are many other cross-cutting agendas like loss and damage. Again, remember, the, the, the same fossil fuels have resulted in what we're now calling the climate crisis as a, and biodiversity loss, right, because of forest fires and other sort of... Um, drivers that are leading to forest loss and stuff so with with that and exposure to climate crisis then we create that gap that results in the need for loss and damage so then that's what i was saying also loss and damage becomes a key point that people might want to follow through and then also noting that energy being at the top 
closely links to food systems, right? The same countries are desert countries and Africa, we know where the way we are situated. We, we, we have data that shows like by the turn of the century again, Sub-Saharan Africa will have expanded, right? Most of the arable land will have been um, called what? Uh, rendered barren and water resources will have depleted and everything. So all these will actually be issues of discussion, but there is that focus on energy and all of these work together to ensure that we have a good outcome at the end of the COP. I had to add this, to ask the question because sometime last year, the conversation on loss and damage caught my eye. And in I think one of the speakers mentioned that many a times we would just like um, nature positive, we would catch a word that COP28 is an energy COP, run with it, but do we really understand why we would term it as that? So for me, last year, loss and damage, I had to quickly go and research what are we talking about? So I feel like as we leave this room, find out why do we have to insist on energy specifically? It might not just be an energy cope, there are other things as well, but just research why are we focusing on energy, loss and damage and all this. Okay, so um, this next question goes to Clara. Um, what are some of the gaps that you have seen at COP27 that you would like to, or rather, I mean, as you as we head to COP28, of course, COP27 had its own um, gaps. The Children and Youth Pavilion was a new thing to us. What are those um, recommendations that you will see to fill those gaps? What would you like to see to fill those gaps that you saw last year at COP27, even as you work towards COP28 in the next few months? So, Clara? I mean... Yeah, there have been different gaps, <laughs> like logistically, there was almost no food at COP27, but um, also, of course, we are talking about the content. So I think um, the biggest gap is actually the fossil fuel debate. And this is also, in my opinion, why we are talking about an energy COP, which is like, because for me, I think it sounds better to say it's an energy COP, but in my opinion, it's a fossil fuel COP, because the president of the COP28 is the running CEO of a fossil fuel company. And we only had like less than two years ago in Glasgow, it was the first time that the actual root of the climate crisis, the fossil fuel extraction was mentioned in any of the COP documents at all. It was the first time COP exists since, I don't know, before 2000s. So um, I think what this year will be on the agenda is the most is how to get the, the acknowledgement that fossil fuels are causing the climate crisis and that we need a coal phase out, we need an oil phase out, and we need a gas phase out needs to be um, discussed and needs to be filled as a gap basically because it has not been tackled enough until now. And yeah, basically this was also the biggest failure of COP27 that they couldn't agree on any phase out of any of those three things only on a call phase down that was already in Glasgow. So yeah, I think really the role of the civil society is to push for a phase out of fossil fuels because, and it's like even more important at this COP because the fossil fuel lobby will be so strong and because they will do everything to not have it in the text. I think this is like the key thing to get in the text and the key gap to fill to um, phase out fossil fuels. Awesome. Thank you so much. Rachel, we'll get to you. Um, but something that's really also caught my attention towards the discussion is the youth perspective when it comes to the discussions at the children and youth pavilion because right here we are youths we are talking about the fossil fuels energy and all that but now focusing on the children and youth pavilion what should be seen different in cop 28 it was the first one last year so this is the second one so what will be what do you expect to be different um, regardless of the confusion that was there last year could you just highlight for us rachel what will be different for you um, this year? What would you like to see it happening differently at the Children and Youth Pavilion? Were you there, actually? Yeah, Were yeah, you there? I was. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, okay, go ahead. 
Um, this is a hard question. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think of what what we actually like have control over because one of the things that would be like amazing is if the pavilion could be bigger and it could have more space and it could have like some quiet space in it because COP is like really loud and noisy and having space to like be be like with people and with like doing this kind of like strategizing work and connecting work with other young people but like in quiet space it could be really nice um but but I'm not sure if that's like possible <laughs> um at an event like COP and so yeah maybe that's like the most I can offer is I think um it would be great to have like kind of the like energy and enthusiasm that was the children and youth pavilion this year but maybe like a bit more space um to make more space for different kinds of young people like not everybody is an extrovert at cop and not everybody can just like go and and be in a crowd of 10,000 30,000 people all day every day for two weeks and so maybe there's like a way that the children and youth pavilion can create space for um different kinds of people who have different things to offer Awesome. So I think even as we tweet, even as we speak about COP28, um, Rachel's word for us is may we have a bigger children and youth pavilion so that you could be able to even interact more and have meaningful conversations leading up to um, as we are there at COP28. We are winding up. And the last question to our three panelists, if you had a magic wand or if you had a superpower, what will be your most um or rather what will be your biggest expectation at cop 28 from a youth perspective if you had a magic wand or a superpower what would be your expectation from a youth perspective at cop 28 clara maybe we'll start with you sorry i just had like a bad connection can you repeat the question please <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, wow, now it's just us two. <laughs> Your work is really cool, Clara. Wow. It's really like important. <laughs> oh, thank you. Like mm -hmm. what are what organization are you from? I work at Youth for Nature. So I work with Kaluki and Orini and Belimo. I'm not sure who you know, but yeah. Um Uranium. Or what? No, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I work with Youth for Nature. Okay, that's so cool. Yeah, I never heard about them until like COP27. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Did you meet somebody from our team at COP? Yes, I met someone who also invited me to this panel, but I mm. forgot his name. I'm so bad with name. Odhiambo. Odhiambo, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's the best. Yes, he was like... We were going together to the green zone mm -hmm. and yeah I was like I was not used to the sun at all <laughs> so I was like feeling so bad was like in the heat and then he brought me back to the blue zone so it was really nice. <laughs> he was like the guide between the green zone and the blue zone he was amazing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you were like in the blue zone as well or? Um, I was on the same delegation as Odiambo, and so ah. um, I only had a, a badge in the blue zone for the second week, and so I spent the first week kind of like in the blue or in the green zone, and at some of the other events that happened like parallel to COP. 
Okay, so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like anybody that is friends with Odiambo is like obviously a rad person because he's the best. <laughs> and so I feel like it also speaks volumes about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm happy then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Youth for Nature, it's like global, right? It's yeah. Global. So, and then, but this event is in Kenya. I was like wondering how are like the local groups linked to yeah. the the global one? We, um, we had like regional teams operating for a while. And so um, we had like a paid like regional director in a lot of regions. And so that's what Kaluki was for a long time for Youth for Nature in Africa. And so he, because he's, based in Nairobi like he built quite a network of like volunteers and community in Nairobi and in Kenya and so they were able to because there's so many of them they were able to host this like awesome event um, wow. yeah it's like so amazing to see like all those young people in this yeah, room <laughs> I know it's really cool yeah. yes and they have this whole day of workshops it's amazing <laughs> yeah I know yeah we actually at Youth for Nature have been running events all week long and so like around the world and so like also this week we had a five-day seminar happening in Mexico City hosted by some of our team members too which was oh, also really cool wow. Yeah. And then there was a workshop in Kigali last week. And then there was also a workshop in um, in Nigeria, like in one of our team members, like hometowns. He brought in like stakeholders and decision makers and did like a cop event with them. So it's been like a really big week for our team. Oh, wow. This is so cool. So that means you're like really stable and like well organized globally, like and in the local context. Well, we try our best. Yeah, we try our best. Yeah. All of these events that have happened this week have really been led by like our volunteer team. They've been incredible to just be wow. like, yeah, I want to do this. So I'm going to make it happen. And we were like, okay. So yeah. This is so amazing to hear because I'm like always, because we have the young European Greens, but then we also, there's like a global young green organization. Mm. And from them, I know it doesn't work pretty well, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes but um we are giving our parting shot and the question is if you had a magic wand what would you like to see different at cop 28 or change yes from a youth yes. perspective yes thank you so if i had a magic wand i think i would I would bring 50, at least like more than 50% youth representatives into the country delegations. So that like we can basically decide about our own future. I think it's all right. And then I would, um, I would have, I would have a decision on a global fossil fuel phase out for like the whole word and it's legally binding okay thank you so much clara and thank you for joining us rachel thank you um i love that uh, magic wand idea from clara about having representation on every country delegation um I might, the, what I would personally add, um, I'm all about the planning and what happens before we get to COP. So I would say that if I had a magic wand, um, all funders would be giving youth funding to prepare for COP months and months in advance instead of like now, <laughs> instead of two months before we go or the month that we're there. So we want funding to be able to prepare and strategize and do the capacity building today. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us today. My parting shot would be, let's work to, together as youth. At the same time, let's do our own research. Understand what is it we are fighting for when, we, or, when you're leading our roads to COP28 on the fight of climate action. COP28 is not just one day or rather two weeks. It's COP28 and beyond, COP27 and beyond. The action is now, let's work together. Thank you. Well, well, 
Well, well, well, well, we are done. Help for me. But most importantly, for yourselves. Thank you very much, Petronila. Thank you very much, Kaluki. Thank you very much, Rachel and Clara, for your clarity. <laughs> I was waiting to use that. <laughs> it was on my bucket list. But anyway, uh, we are 10 minutes past time, but this is good time to call it a day. We have had great learnings from today. I wonder what yours are. Uh, but mine, most importantly, is collaboration among youth, among stakeholders, among everyone who needs to be at COP28 and among everyone who needs to have their voices had so that we get shown the money, but also get given the money. Yes, it's not just about showing us the money, it's also about give us the money for us to do the actions. Pulimo said we have brilliant ideas, we have the brains to do them, we have the capacity, we just need the resources. Yeah? Now, people, let me return you to the very beginning of this day. At about 9.15, when we were beginning, oh, we're actually not late. We're four minutes early. Again, clap for me. Thank you very much. No, no, no. <laughs> I was joking. Um, but, you know, I spoke about the objectives that had been set aside for this workshop, and I just want to remind us of them. There were three, and one was to demystify the myths and misconceptions surrounding cops, assess how young people have been navigating cops before, and explore ways to make their presence in these spaces impactful and also build synergies and solidarity among youth and youth movements as we gear up towards COP28, what is mostly touted as what the what COP? The energy COP, yeah? So I, I feel like in my assessment, as uh, when I remove my MC hat, my moderator hat, and I put on my assessor hat, I feel like we have met the objectives. I don't know if you do. Do you? Do you? Please say yes, otherwise I may not be paid. Please say yes. <laughs> you guys are being paid. <laughs> anyway, uh, I have sticky notes on my on my hand, and I want to pass them. Please pick one. I want to take just a minute or two to write down what this day has been like for you. And in also in relation to the objectives that, are, that I've just spoken about. If you want to write about the food, the venue, the facilities, please pick another sticky note. But on the first one, please write about the expectations, how, whether they have been met or not, and your greatest learning for the day. Sawa, sawa. Uh, I will end this day by giving a special vote of thanks to some of you. This has been, and I've kept saying this since morning, this has been a journey, yeah? Youth for Nature as an organization has been a journey. I want to boldly thank everyone who thought about the idea, but also everyone who works for it, everyone who ensures that youth are actually engaged and input in this very special discussion. I want to give a very special thank you to my good friend, Kaluki. Yes, you're my good friend. If, if, if you did not know, I am holding a mic and now I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, my good friend, Kaluki, for having conceptualized the idea around the Africa Youth Caravan. It's brilliant. It's always brilliant to bring young people to spaces where decisions are made to make young people decision makers. And I like what, you know, is written in your bio, that that is your passion. May it continue being your passion. May it continue inspiring you to do much more. Yeah. May we see um, Africa Youth Caravans to COP28, to other COPs and so on. I also want to thank the organizers of the event. Uh, Again, at high level, it was Kaluki, but then, Kunawatu Amkono, Ambao Amefanya Kazi. 
but uh, and 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 for our online audience i want to say this categorically and i'm looking at the camera while i'm saying this what i'm going means handy men <laughs> they're very handy uh, but they're very helpful and this i i am proud to call these people my friends also it's been a journey working with them it's been a journey planning for this i feel and uh looking back i feel like it's it has gone as best as it could to you jafar toriemi and to you peter bulimo congratulations for making it up to this level in the utah all the way from uganda congratulations yeah the light skin from the west uh, west nile yes that that was the word i was looking for earlier congratulations to you for making this thing happen congratulations to our online counterparts as well i know you had to collaborate with a lot of people online to ensure that invites are sent out you know everything is in place thank you very much to you all the teams at youth for nature teams at kin uh vinambra yes uh teams at uh africa youth caravan as well i also want to thank odiambo who's been our soft technical guy before i move on to our did someone want to clap for him you you may you may thank you bulimo <laughs> you know the ambo now you can see who appreciates <laughs> but i also want to pass our sincere gratitude to the crew uh all those machines as you can see there they're not very easy to handle these are the machines you know when 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 you're told um do not operate heavy machinery when drunk this also includes that yeah don't don't go operating that so you know thank you very much to all of you thank you for ensuring that we have sound we have lighting that i look that good on tv that i look very good on my pictures as well so thank you very much to you thank you to ubunifu hub i i, I don't know if janet maybe you can take the thanks for them uh but thank you to ubunifu hub and gerans gerans if you are somewhere this is me saying thank you if i have network as much as possible meet new people say hi to whoever you liked the best um and connect engage you never know where these connections will lead to yeah one good to speak oh you you come come oh okay but we have good pictures of you will photoshop you <laughs> uh yeah we 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 have good we have very good photos of you yeah so again uh, you know i cannot insist how grateful i am my heart is full of gratitude for having listened to me i know um on, on fridays i don't have the best voice but you listened to me uh you know and 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 you allowed me to guide you through today So thank you very much and with that um I don't know if we pray or shall we stand for a moment of silence during that moment of silence you may pray to your god and uh, so that we have a lot of inclusion may we stand
to close this. All right. Uh, if you're online, you may stand with us, please, also. And let's have a moment of silence during which you can pray, intercede for us to ensure that we have the best COP28 ever, to ensure that the road there leads to clarity and leads to a lot of impact for our people in Africa and across the world. Thank you very much. And until next time, good bye, good night, have a good weekend, enjoy yourselves, and we will see you at the next forum such as like such as this one. Please give your sticky notes to Peter Bulimo. Thank you.